for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plains of the internet. My goodness, it is Friday and we've got Michael Sussman transcripts. We're on day five of this trial. We had almost a full eight hours of FBI James Baker, former general counsel over there. We have Robbie Mook who testified today. And Elon Musk even joined the game, and so we've got a lot to get to today. I want to welcome you to the show. Hello, my friends. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney here at the r r Law Group. We're located in Scottsdale, Arizona. We've been covering the Durham prosecution, former Hillary Clinton campaign lawyer Michael Sussman, indicted by John Durham, and he's being charged with one count of lying to the FBI for proffering, promoting the Trump-Russia collusion hoax, and we've got the transcripts, and we're going to get into those today. Before we do, as we like to start the show, we want to get our bearings straight by taking a look at the mind map. And the mind map is available. I always forget to send it in the chat. There it is. And so let me pin that right there. But this is also available in the link tree down in the description below. And what we've been doing is been covering all of the different tentacles, all the facets of this case, as we've been covering it over the last several months and weeks. But just to get our bearings straight, remember, this is the Durham prosecution of this guy, Michael Sussman. And if you were here yesterday, you remember that we actually had Mark Elias as a different tentacle. But today we combine the two. We're actually going to put Sussman under Mark and we're going to add another branch for Hillary for America. And why is this? Well, over the last several days, we've heard a lot of this name. These names come out in the trial. We know these are people sort of connected to the Clinton campaign. But now they're coming out in trial. Now they're sort of becoming a part of the formal record. Robbie Mook, of course, is a witness who testified today. John Podesta, somebody else who's been referenced a lot, Jake Sullivan and Jennifer Palmieri. Jake Sullivan is Biden's national security advisor. And so he's been quite around, uh, around quite a lot. But this was the structure that we've got. Not much has changed under Perkins Coy. We're pretty much familiar with all this stuff. We had some interesting new issues pop up today. One interesting issue that we'll see came out because Robbie Mook, I think, introduced this. And I'm, I'm not actually sure if we're going to get to this one today or if this is going to be in the afternoon transcript whenever we get those. But Judge Cooper originally ruled that a tweet that Hillary Clinton posted was excluded, could not be brought in as evidence. But guess what? It is. It came in as evidence because somebody opened the door for it and it got read in. And so we'll come back and we'll check on that one and see what's going on there. But we hear a lot today from Eric, uh, I'm sorry, we talk a lot about today, Eric Lickblau, the New York Times reporter. We've got testimony or direct and cross-examinations from both of the defense attorneys today. Sean Berkowitz really took the lead on James Baker, did all of the cross-examination on the FBI agent. And then Michael Bosworth is going to be the guy who does the cross-examination for Robbie Mook. And we'll notice that if we scroll up to the days here, we are breaking this down literally day by day. So day one, jury selection, day two, opening arguments. We are now on day five. Yesterday, we did literally the whole day on James Baker. I mean, he was there for all morning, all afternoon, and a good part of the morning today. And I think even a good part of the morning, I'm sorry, a good part of the afternoon on Wednesday. So almost three days of testimony, about a full eight hours if you combine them all together. And so James Baker, we'll talk about him. Both transcripts are up for from yesterday. But today then, we're going to start with James Baker, Jim Baker, and then Robbie Mook, Hillary Clinton campaign manager for the 2016 campaign. But before we jump into that, I wanted to show you a couple interesting things that were happening on Twitter as of this afternoon. Elon is joining the game on the Sussman trial, which is very fun because not a lot of people have been talking about this. If I go on YouTube and I search Michael Sussman, my videos don't show up. It's all Fox News videos and all of the mainstream sources before my videos ever show up. After we finish these live streams, every single time we get off the live streams, it is demonetized every single time. And we're not even saying anything bad here. We're just talking about the words criminal law and investigations and FBI demonetized every time. And Elon and many others are starting to notice this. So Elon got on Twitter and he posted this earlier today. He said, uh, actually, he was responding to a message from Jim Jordan. Jim Jordan posted this. He said, Christopher Steele created the dossier. Glenn Simpson sold it to the press. Michael Sussman took it to the FBI and the Democrats and the media lied to you all about it. And it feels like Jim Jordan is sort of reading right off of our mind map here because he's got that exactly right, right? He's got all the tentacles fleshed out for us. 
And we can see that here. The Steel dossier was something created by Fusion or by Steel, sold to Fusion, which went over to Perkins Coy. Rodney Jaffe was the CETO of Newstar. And then all of this came through Michael Sussman to the FBI. And once the media got a hold of this, yeah, they were burying it. I mean, there were stories from Fusion GPS employees working at Fusion GPS, which was a consultant to Perkins, which was a, a basically an employee of Hillary for America. They were emailing the media, telling the media that you should drop the Hillary email story because that's bad for her and pick up the Trump-Russia collusion hoax. I mean, they were literally out there doing PR. So Jim Jordan was talking about that, and, and uh, Elon is is confirming that, right? He said, yeah, I know that, and he's putting that out to his 93, I think, million followers, which is very fun and appreciated. So he says that we also have him posting a couple hours ago. Elon Musk wrote, sus, man. He said, sus, man. You see that? Sus, man. And I'm, he's right. He is sus. This whole thing is sus. And there's one more from Elon, which was very interesting. He posted this about an hour ago. Said Tesla is building a hardcore litigation department where we directly initiate and execute lawsuits. This team is going to directly report to me. Please send me three to five bullet points describing evidence of exceptional ability to justice at Tesla.com. So he was talking about Sussman, talking about the Democrats, and he's just saying, we're just going to start a whole legal division. How about that? That's how angry I am about this. He says, my commitment, we will never seek victory in a just case against us. Even if we will probably win, we will never surrender, settle an unjust case against us. Even if we will probably lose, please include links to cases that you've tried. So email over at justice at tesla.com. And, you know, I think that might be a little fun, uh, fun, uh, thing to continue to follow. Let's see what Elon is able to do with the litigation department, because we know the Democrats have a big one, a very big one. And it's run literally by this guy. Okay. It's this guy. It's Mark Elias. Everybody in the DNC knows he's the head honcho. He's the big dog. He's in charge of all of their litigation. He worked for Kerry. He worked for Obama. He worked for Hillary. He's trying to, to sort of recircle the wagons on behalf of the DNC in all of the upcoming elections. And so very, very, very uh, involved. And Elon is creating his own little counterforce. So that should be fun. But it, it, regardless of what happens with the Justice Department team or the Justice team over at Tesla, we, all, we know that Elon is at least boosting the signal on this entire investigation, which is very, very good news. And so that's the bearings that we are sort of laying out here on this lovely Friday. I want to thank the super chat that came in, two of them. First one came in from Mark Pate for a, a dono to the transcripts, which is very much appreciated. These transcripts here, as we're about to go through, are a buck 20 a page. And I'm paying at these and you're supporting the the funding of me obtaining these transcripts. And so thank you very much. That's Mark Pate and Tom Carraway, also with a super chat dono. And I appreciate that, right? All of these are literally going to the transcripts. It's going to be about 4,000 4, bucks by my estimate if it goes two weeks. And so I do appreciate that. But without any further ado, my goodness. So yesterday we finished the show. It was three hours. It was a lot. And we were talking about Jim Baker, James Baker, former FBI general counsel, the guy who actually met with Sussman. So we zoom in on this. This is James Baker, and we really should be beefing him up. He's a pretty big witness in this whole case. And he is the guy that Sussman sat down with at that very first meeting. And this is where the lie originates. There's a lot of questions about whether this is a material lie. There's questions about whether uh, he actually did lie, right? Whether he said what he said, and whether if he said what he said, whether it was material. And there's questions about the billing record because part of this story is that he went back and billed Hillary for it. Well, what kind of bill was it? And so a lot of questions here, but James Baker has been on the stand for now three days. This is his third day back and he gets started as follows. Well, the court's going to go through some preliminary stuff as they typically do. Let's make sure we've got our big thick red pen, just like we like it. And we see here, your honor, if I can talk briefly about scheduling prosecutors talking about this saying, yeah, Mr. Baker is going to go through the end of the day. We've got a couple other witnesses, Mark Chattison and Kevin P. Kevin P. was the uh, is the current CIA agent that Mr. DeFilippis accidentally outed the other day. Oops on that one. But the court asks, uh, can we get there? Can we go through all of these things? He says, I don't think they're going to be too long, but I don't want to speak for the defense. The court says, all right, well, you have me. I hope you have the jury. And the prosecutor says, yes, your honor. 
court acknowledges that we said Fridays might be here. And so they call the court back into session. They bring the jurors back. They say, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, this was right after lunch yesterday. Uh, before we get back here with Mr. Baker, I just want to go over a few scheduling matters, make sure that you guys can come back here on Friday. Nobody's got a vacation or anything. No, all right. Jurors are all nodding. Okay. All right. Yes, judge. So then the prosecutor, DeFilippis, takes the stand, jumps up to the podium. Baker's behind the, the witness bench, says, welcome back, Mr. Baker. Well, thank you. I'm going to show you one more excerpt from your congressional testimony yesterday. And remember yesterday, we're going to see a lot of this again today. We're going to fast forward through most of this. Okay, so let me just preface this out for a quick minute. James Baker has been sort of in this investiga investigation for a very long time. Former general counsel to the FBI. We're now in 2022. We had crossfire hurricane. We had all sorts of congressional hearings and testimony and all this stuff going on for years now, five years after the fact. And so he's been interviewed. He's been communicating with prosecutors. He's had lots of conversations about this entire inquiry. And yesterday, the prosecutor, DeFilippis, was going through one of those congressional records, right? He was going through literally page by page. When you, when you testified in front of Congress, you said this right here, but here today, you're saying something that's a little bit different. Would you care to explain that? All right. And he does. And he does it again. Well, what about this one? This one's different. How about that one? And so on and so forth. And so we spend a lot of time doing that because the defense is going to make a big deal about this. The defense is going to say that Mr. Baker, James Baker, former counsel for the FBI, doesn't remember anything. This all happened a long time ago, and he didn't take notes on this meeting, and he can't remember what Sussman said. And so now we have to say and sort of presume we got to give Sussman the benefit of the doubt since there's no notes, and this is six years ago. And since Jim Baker is such a buffoon, he just didn't, he can't remember anything. His memory is all faulty. We have to do what defense attorneys want all of us to do and acquit, vote not guilty, saying there's not enough evidence to get beyond that reasonable doubt standard. So Baker is now going to have to sort of just sit here as a witness and relive all of that testimony. Now that testimony is important, but because it's very repetitive, he's sort of literally reading through the transcript of a prior congressional testimony. We are going to fast forward through some of that. But now let me just give you a brief starting on this. They say, okay, look, DeFilippis is turning back to page 122 of the transcript. So they're reading transcripts just like we're reading transcripts. Ah, he says, all right, Mr. Baker. So do you remember that the issue of your meeting with Mr. Sussman came up multiple times during your testimony in front of Congress? He says, uh, yes, including on the second day when you were testifying? Yes. And he says, <clears throat> if I could, I'll read the part of someone named Mr. Jordan. Who is Mr. Jordan? Do you know? He says, yeah, I know that guy. He's a Republican congressman from Ohio, I believe. And so this is exactly what they're doing. Now, because they're back after the lunch, they set all this back up again. Okay, where do we start? Why don't you start near the top where it says, yes, sir. Okay, so now Jim Baker is reading his testimony from a prior congressional hearing. He says, yes, sir. And there was some effort. There was some belief that this was being conducted in a way to make it a covert communications channel. And the prosecutor says, Quote, okay, my first question would be, how'd you get this? Did you just ask that question? Just pausing there, Mr. Baker. This was talking about your meeting with Sussman, wasn't it? And Baker says, yeah, I believe so. Okay, so go ahead. And Baker says, well, I responded to that question from Jim Jordan. He said, I did ask that question at a high level, yes. And he explained that he had obtained it from cyber experts. Okay, so they're talking about Sussman. Now, this is not in a court of law. This is Jim Jordan in a congressional hearing who's asking him questions however he wants. And you just go, that's Congress. They yell at each other. They talk for five minutes and they ask like a useless question and they talk some more, right? It's all useless. But Jim Jordan is trying to ask some real questions. And here's the response back in Congress. Yeah, he got it from cyber experts. And he said that the details would explain themselves. Okay, that's the recollection. So he said that in Congress and now it's gonna be a little bit different. Saying, yeah, that was all about Mr. Sussman. So as you see, right, all of this stuff that's indented here, all of this that we have this big sort of, uh, yeah, indention, this is all just reading from the testimony, right? Reading from prior congressional testimony and he's flipping him back. Okay, go to the earlier part of the page when you said this, I don't think, as I said last time, I don't remember when, okay. And they're just going through and you're expressing uncertainty and you, you're sort of looking for context and he's confused by the question and they're continuing to go through the exchange. I'm sorry, still, I'm losing the thrust of your question. Okay. And so they're battling back and forth, just sort of like, you know, hashing their way through this thing. 
Finally, they get over with some of the testimony and finally the prosecutor changes topics. Good Lord. All right, good. Now, switching topics, Mr. Baker, does the name Rodney Jaffe mean anything to you? And this is the prosecution asking the their witness who is James Baker, FBI, about this guy right here, the photograph, Rodney Jaffe. We know he's in the mind map. He was the CTO of Newstar. We're gonna learn a lot more about them today. Newstar was the entity that was concocting all of these white papers. They were basically colluding with Fusion GPS to insert themselves into the DNS records so that they could get access to the Trump White House, Trump Tower, New York, and other locations. That's the guy. So now the prosecutor asks the FBI about this. Does the Rod name Rodney Joffe ring a bell to you? Yes, it does. And if so, how do you know him? He says, well, Mr. Joffe, I believe, is associated with New Star. And how do you know that there, Jim? He says, well, I know that in the aftermath, I, I guess you would say, that of this investigation, I met with Sussman and others on behalf of New Star while I was general counsel of the FBI. So he had come to meet with me on behalf of the client of that client at that time. Prosecutor asks, and do you recall, was that before or after your meeting with Alpha Bank on the Alpha Bank issue, right? there? And they use this a lot, this Alpha Bank issue to sort of reference the entire conspiracy that Trump was communicating with Alpha Bank, that this was the channel where he was getting his sort of instructions from Putin. And they were using a lot of their money through Paul Manafort and Spectrum Health and all these other locations. So now we're trying to flesh out the timeline. He says, I think that was before the meeting on Alpha Bank. So they got together and they were powwowing before they actually came up with the scheme. And was there any particular issue that you came up with there, Jim? Yes. What was it? He said, well, it had to do basically with concerns that Newstar had about a contract for telecommunication services that had to do with a phone number and portability and cell phone portability. Baker says, my understanding is the U.S. government, my recollection, I should say, is that the U.S. government was contemplating giving that contract to a foreign company telecommunications contract, and that Newstar wanted to raise concern with the Bureau about national security, saying not good to have a foreign company running the U.S. telecommunications system. So they came to meet with the FBI. Jaffe says, you, look, if you're going to give this DNS access to the Russians, could be problems. You better give it to us so I can make up the Russians, then you'll be much safer. But Baker goes on, he says, this was also, they clearly had a business interest in this. They wanted a contract. He understood, and I recall to the best of my ability, that they had at that point in time. He says, in other words, they were losing the business. They wanted that contract. They said it was going to a foreign company. They wanted the FBI to intercede on their behalf with parts of the US government to make this decision reverse itself, all right? So they lost a contract. They know, oh man, this is a big contract. We're supposed to manage the DNS records, basically the phone book of the internet. If you need to get somewhere, I need to dial a website. You gotta open up the phone book to figure out where to go. And that's the DNS system. So New Star had the contract. They were going to lose it probably because they were, you know, doing something, I don't know, not, not being a good business or whatever. And it gets outsourced now. So they go to the FBI and they say, you got to save our business. You can't allow this outsourcing to happen. Please keep it in the United States. Obviously, they have a business interest. That's where Jaffe is meeting. And this meeting, it sounds like, took place before the meeting on Alpha Bank. And in what context did Mr. Sussman disclose to you that he was coming, did, did, let me say this, did Sussman disclose to you that he was coming on behalf of a client? And guess what Baker says? Yes, he was. Oh, so this is very fun, isn't it? What this means is that Michael Sussman, when it's possible, is capable of actually communicating that he is there on behalf of a specific client. Because when he met with James Baker, he came there and he communicated, I'm here on behalf of a client. It's for New Star. So he can do it. He can make an affirmative statement. All right. And they talk a little bit more about Jaffe and some more involvement. How aggressively were you pursuing this incident? He says, well, he said they were quite concerned about it from New Star. They came in, they had at least one meeting with us. I wouldn't say they were aggressive, but they were raising serious concerns. And at all times, at all times when Sussman was here, did you know who Sussman was there for? Baker says, yeah, absolutely. He was representing Newstar the whole time. He told us. And so that's pretty obvious. Other people were there. Who was the prosecutor on that? Oh, Mr. Durham was there. And he's been special counsel for a long time investigating a lot of different things. They ask him, 
about whether his interactions with the team. So now that Baker has been communicating with Durham, they're saying, did, did Durham pressure you? Did he cause you to change or differ or shade your opinion as a result of, of this investigation or any prior investigation? He says, no, why not? Asks the prosecutor. He says, well, ladies and gentlemen, because my obligation is to tell the truth, first of all. And secondly, to the best of my recollection, before you all started me asking questions about this, it was my understanding that Durham had closed the case with a recommendation, and so it's not something that's going to prejudice me. Prosecutor changes gears, says, let's go back to that text message exchange. Government Exhibit 1500 that you had with Sussman. And this was back when Sussman sent him the message and said, hey, I've got some dangerous information the FBI needs to be known about, and I am just a good citizen coming on my own volition. Prosecutor asks, they say, is it fair to say that you continued contact with Sussman for a while after you left the FBI? And Baker says, yes. And so they fast forward then to 2019. And remember these dates, right? This is important. We have 2016, September, which is when the meeting was. We have another March meeting that takes place in 2017, right after the election. Trump's in charge now. And Baker and Sussman, and Sussman in particular, is continuing to send text messages and sort of reach out to everybody who was involved. So back then, in January 22nd, 2019, Trump's still in charge now. Baker gets a text from Sussman, 9.05 a.m. Sussman writes, he says, Jim, we were contacted by Fox saying they're running a news story and they asked for comments. My firm, Perkins Coy, gave them the same one from before. Anyway, I'm passing this along because I wouldn't have seen it if no one told me. Nothing important and just FYI. Can we speak this afternoon on an unrelated topic? So a little interesting little kind of a tip off, a little heads up on a story coming out. Prosecutor asks Baker, how'd you react to this text message? Baker says, it's just a friendly heads up by Michael about this article. And he says, well, what did he talk about when he was saying, Do you, can you meet this afternoon about an unrelated topic? Any idea what that's about? Actually, no, I don't really recall about that sitting here today. And he says that a lot as we're going to see. So then they go back through another text. Any recollection, Jim? No. Then we have another one. January 22nd, same date. Sussman sends you what appears to be a screenshot of a Donald Trump tweet by the former president. Oh, no. Was it a mean tweet? How did you take that? Baker says, again, just a friendly heads up. And we don't really know what the tweet says. A friendly heads up. I'm quite confident I've already seen this tweet by this point in time. But yeah, you know, Donald Trump's probably talking about the loser FBI idiots. And Baker's like, great. He's dead right. I'm totally screwed. And Baker it says, uh, but yeah. And the prosecutor's like, is that because it refers to you? He says, well, it refers to me and Michael, yes. The same tweet from the former president. <laughs> and so they got called out. And so Sussman's just like, oh, shoot, Trump just tweeted about me and Jim. I better tell Jim. He's probably still asleep or something. So he sends it over to Jim and Jim's like, oh, darn it. We got called out again. So the prosecutor says, all right, move on to the next page. How about this one in January? Again, same date, 4.07 p.m. Another article referred. Uh, yeah. And so they just you can see what's happening. They're going through a number of different text messages. They're talking about the congressional testimony that took place. And then we see June 10th of 2019. So we were in January. We fast forward to June. Five months later, Baker is asked about this text message. Sussman sends another one. Hey, Jim, heard you saw Rodney yesterday. We know who that is. Rodney Joffe, right? I'm in town the rest of June and would enjoy getting together. Would you like to meet for lunch or dinner one of these days? If so, let me know what's best. Michael. Prosecutor asks Baker, says, the reference to Rodney is right there. Any recollection of what this is? Baker says, I believe it was a reference to Rodney Jaffe. I believe I ran into Rodney on the margins of some type of conference or something. He's like, I was working at a big think tank there. Part of my job is to go around to conferences. I met people, I spoke with them, and that's it. And if that's the case, if you spoke to Jaffe, did you connect him in any way to September 19, 2016 with Sussman? When you met Rodney after the fact, did you have any idea he was involved in this giant scheme? Baker says no. Do you remember of anything other this, other than this interaction with Rodney? He says, nope, it's just a fleeting sort of a thing. Very brief, hello, and that's it. They move on to the next pages, and you can see, right, going on and on and on. July 2019, we have another one talking about a lunch meeting. Been there for 10 minutes, go into a place, went to a different place because they were full. They have a number of discussions, and then we have a meeting on September 19th. 
no questions, not, not, can't recall anything, doesn't know whether he did it for Newstar or not. Another one. If we look to May now, May 5th, 2020, prosecutor says this one came in at 10.28 p.m. Can you read that one here for us there, Jim? Jim says, happy to. From Michael, Jim, I just heard the good news. Congratulations to you and especially to Twitter for getting you on their team. I've been working with them for 10 years and I love the company. Great issues, lots of fun challenges for you and some really good people. Does Elon know about this? He, he may want to buy Twitter a lot more quickly. Can I screenshot this real quick? Yeah, let's just screenshot that right there. Elon may want to know about this. So Sussman has been working at Twitter for 10 years. Sussman tried to get James Baker a job at Perkins Coy, but James Baker just couldn't cut it over there, I guess, and ended up moving on, got a job over at some other entity and then ended up at Twitter. So now Elon is, he's got a problem with Sussman and the Democrats. Does he know how close Michael Sussman is with all the Democrats over there at the Twitter? Pretty big incestuous bunch, isn't it? Twitter, Perkins Coy, Democratic National Committee, Hillary for America. And then we have most of the media and we have all of Twitter and the FBI on top of that. So it's pretty bad, yeah. Well, the answer comes, uh, um, uh, let me start with this. Baker's having a difficult time reading some of this out. <clears throat> he says, uh, how do you respond? Thanks, Michael. Thanks for the message. I look forward to working with you, exclamation point. If you don't mind, please keep it under your hat until Friday. I haven't turned my, told my current employer yet. Hope all is well with your family. Michael responds back, absolutely. I understand it's not public. Same to you and your family. And then they just finish it out. Now, this was a little bit weird. A couple days later, he sent another text. Jim, last Monday, I sent a detailed Twitter org chart to you at your Yahoo account. And tonight I send an updated version. Is there an older current email address? Should I send it elsewhere? So why is Michael Sussman have access to a detailed Twitter org chart. It's kind of strange, isn't it? He doesn't work at Twitter. James is James Baker is about to go over there and work at Twitter. So he'll get the org chart when he gets there. Why is Michael Sussman sending him org charts? Why does he have access to that? He also has access to a badge at the FBI. He just goes around wherever he wants, anytime he wants that. That's weird. Who is this guy? He's like sort of like a fixer, right? He just kind of has access to certain things. He just makes things happen behind the scenes. Somebody better tell Elon. All right, so uh, James Baker, you know, sort of getting tired of Sussman texting him all the time. He's like, so sorry I didn't respond. Had a rough week last week, still digging out. All right, let's talk later. Best of luck. Prosecutor now asks about this. Says, I want to go back to that prior meeting back in 2016. And this is the big meeting, the September 19th meeting. I want to ask you if you knew that Mr. Sussman were at that meeting for a client, if he were there, if you would have known, right? If you knew that at the time, would that have mattered to you? Very important question here. Mattered. Would it have mattered? Throughout this entire trial, this has been a big defense. It's the little white lie defense. Okay. Sussman is being charged with one count of lying to the FBI. That's it. But that lie, according to the U.S. Code, it's got to be a material lie, right? He can't go into the FBI and say, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I ate a healthy breakfast this morning. Like we all know that's not true. I mean, if you're Michael Sussman, but if he went in there and told that to James Baker, James Baker would be like, it's great. What do you want me to do about that? Right. It's, it's, it's immaterial. It's not consequential to anything. So if you're going to lie to the FBI, it's got to be a material lie. And so this question is very important. Jim, when Sussman lied to you, did it matter to you whether he was there on behalf of a client or not? Would that have changed the equation at all? He says, yes, it would. Oh, tell me more. Why, Mr. Baker? Baker goes on. You see a big, long explanation here. Perfect. This is good testimony. This is how testimony is supposed to work in a criminal case. The government asks a question and their witness is very favorable and they give them just a smack, at, you know, a, a, a home run right out of the park on the answer. And this is how it works. Now we have not gotten most of this here because Mark Elias is, yeah, he was a government witness, but he was not a friendly government witness. He was a defense witness. Same with Laura Sego. She works for Fusion GPS. And Jim Baker is friends with Michael Sussman. He almost got him jobs in multiple places and sent him the Twitter org, org chart. Here's what the answer is from Jim. He says, well, look, 
It would have mattered if he said that he was there with a client. Multiple. He says, I think there's multiple dimensions to this. So one would be with respect to the logistics of the meeting. Like I was going, would I meet with Michael alone? Would I meet with him with somebody else? Would I not meet with him at all, depending on who the client was? It would make me think about how I would analyze and assess the reliability of the information that he was conveying, depending on the identity of the client that might impact my assessment of that. Baker says, you know, it might impact how I thought about whether or how we should prioritize the work on the information that he gave us. Should we go quickly or slowly or whatever? It would also cause me to think deeply about that. And then it would also, I think, make me think about the extent to which I needed to have my team of lawyers conduct a legal review of the material that was actually being presented to us. In other words, says Jim, I was willing to meet with Michael alone because I had high confidence in him and trust. And that might have, I think, I would have made a different decision and a different assessment if he had said that he was appearing on behalf of a client. Okay, that right there, folks, illegally is what's called materiality. If Sussman said, I'm here for Hillary, it would have made a material change in how Baker would have assessed the whole situation. And because he didn't, in fact, he affirmatively said, I'm not coming on behalf of a client. Baker trusted that, relied on that, and so it impacted how he was analyzing and assessing the situation. And so that's basically the perfect answer, right? That's like a, that's a 100% home run. Well done there, Jim. And the prosecutor doesn't want to stop there. He says, oh, perfect. Great answer. I want to break that down a little bit for like the next 40 hours because it's really good. If Mr. Sussman had texted you and said that he wanted to come meet you because he was doing work on behalf of the Clinton campaign, would you have taken the meeting, Jim? If he sent you a text the night before that said the opposite of what he said and said, I'm actually coming on behalf of Hillary. She sent me down here. Would you have met with him? Jim says, I don't think I would have. Prosecutor asks very reasonably, why? Baker responds, well, because the Clinton campaign, well, the former Secretary of State Clinton had been under investigation by the FBI with respect to her emails for a long period of time under investigation herself. And by that point in time in September, we had not technically closed the investigation, but we completed our work as we announced publicly and as Director James Comey announced. But there was still a team of agents working on the matter. The matter, to my recollection, was still open. Everybody knows we eventually did reopen the case. So I think I would have said to Michael, I think you need to meet with, first of all, you shouldn't meet with me. You should, if you have any information you want to bring to us, you should meet with the case agents associated to Hillary and her email investigation referred to as the mid-year exam because there's a whole other FBI team involved in this. So I think you should meet with the mid-year exam folks, is what Jim says. If you're meeting on behalf of Clinton, I don't think you should come see me, is how he explained this, because it could be a conflict of interest. Question, if you had learned or known that Sussman was coming in for a client with business interests, so let's say it's not Clinton, let's say this person just had business interests, not a political campaign, would you have taken the meeting, Jim? Jim says, well, you know, I might have taken the meeting. First of all, I would have wanted to know what he, who are you talking about, right? Who is this? What does that mean? I would have wanted to know more about that. And then depending on the nature of that, I might've decided not to have the meeting at all. Or I think I would have decided to have others in the meeting with me, depending on the part of the office of general counsel. For example, whoever might be working on the particular case. And Jim says, I want to explain this a little bit further. So hang on a minute. If I could just back up on both of these things, FBI, former general counsel says, had there been any reference to, you know, we're coming in and talking about a thing related to Russia, if he, if he had said Russia and Trump, then I certainly would have referred this to what we called the Crossfire Hurricane Team. So it's a lot of materiality. If he would have said Hillary and Russia, the whole, it wouldn't have just gone, you know, another direction, or maybe he declines the meeting. He said, no, there's a whole other team here. I got to get involved in this. Baker explains, Crossfire Hurricane was the code name for the FBI's investigation of the Trump-Russia matter. So if I had known anything of that, I would have said, no, wait, you need to meet with the Crossfire Hurricane team and not with me. Pretty material. Prosecutor dives in, loving this, says, would it have mattered to you if you learned that he was coming in? Would it have mattered to you that he was coming in on behalf of Rodney Jaffe, another tech executive? Baker's thinking about it. He says, mm -hmm. same answer, I think, as a moment ago. By that point in time, well, if I had understood Joffe's connection to Newstar, and if Joffe was coming in related to Newstar, then I would have wanted a team of my attorneys with me to make sure we understand exactly what's being presented to us, because that would have changed with all these scenarios. It would have changed my assessment of the logistics of the meeting and how I was thinking about who was bringing this information to me. 
very, very material. Now, the defense is going to you know, dive into a lot of this here, as we'll see short, shortly. But the prosecution is sort of wrapping this up here, says, and how common is it for you, somebody in your position, the general counsel, to receive this type of thing, di evidence directly? Is that something that you did often, Jim? Jim says, no, that's not common. No, as I mentioned earlier, no. And then they talk about, you know, why he might have wanted others in the meeting with him. And we spent a lot of time on that yesterday, actually talking, you know, Jim was saying that he didn't know what Sussman was going to bring him about. They talk a little bit about confidential human sources and, and some of Jim's hesitation, thinking that maybe Baker, I'm sorry, maybe Sussman was in fact a confidential human source and why that might, you know, cause him to not bring anyone else into the room either to notify or tip them off because the defense is going to break that apart. You didn't take notes. You didn't bring anybody else in with you. And you don't remember a bunch of stuff. And you testify differently when you were in front of Congress. You don't remember anything. And there's no notes. And so you don't know what he told you in there, did you? And yesterday we learned that Jim Baker said, uh, no, I'm 100% certain that I know exactly what he said. And today we're going to get a cross-examination from Berkowitz, I believe, that really tries to unpack that. He does a good job, but I'm not so sure it's going to be successful. We'll see. So then we finally get down, prosecutor says, all right, Mr. Baker, another question for you. To what extent, if at all, would a political affiliation, like if somebody was a Democrat or working for Hillary, or motivation affect the FBI's analysis or their investigation? Would it change the way you pursue this thing? Baker says, well, look, as I said in the excerpt of a testimony that we read previously, if anybody of any stripe comes to the FBI, says that there's a crime being committed, he says, we're going to take it and we're going to deal with it. But at the same time, when you're receiving information, he says, let me be more specific. When the FBI is receiving information, of course, we look at the identity of the source of the information and we make an assessment of the reliability or the credibility of that person. Wow, that's great. I'm surprising that they do that because they didn't do much of that in this case, but let's see what he says. He says, so in that case, for example, if the opponent in the presidential election of Donald Trump brought us information related to Donald Trump, we would have looked at it very, very carefully. Okay, that's kind of what happened here. It's not to say we wouldn't have done anything, but we would have looked at it differently. We would have, I think, taken more time with it. We would have subjected it to additional scrutiny. Yeah, we just, it would have raised very serious questions, certainly in my mind, about the credibility of the information, the credibility of the source, the veracity of the information, and heightened, heightened in my mind, a substantial concern about whether we were going to be played or pulled into the politics of this. Which is just, a, a, it's a wild answer coming from him because he knows Michael Sussman and he knew Michael Sussman at the time and he knew that Michael Sussman was working for Hillary and the Perkins Coy and the DNC. But Jim came in and said, uh, I'm sorry, Sussman came in and said, I'm not here on behalf of anybody. And there was almost no follow-up to that. Anyways, he says, it would have been raised. I mean, the whole thing that we talked about earlier about the press, that would have alarmed me considerably if I had known this was a political candidate. As I said earlier, we were aware of being played and of having our investigations, quote, being the thing that enables the press to report on it. The press, he says, in my estimation, the press doesn't want to report on something that's, I'll use the term, a nothing burger, right? They don't want to report about that. They might report about it, as I said earlier, that the FBI is investigating the nothing burger. And so I would have been very wary about that, about being sucked into that type of effort with respect to these different types of scenarios. So, you know, I, yes, I know that we could have been played. And I know that if this were a political candidate, I would have had concerns. I know that if it was somebody who was specifically for the Clintons, probably wouldn't have even taken the meeting would have passed it off to somebody else. They talk about the three different tiers of investigations that the FBI has. And so we get into some technical stuff there. But if we jump down a little bit, we are going to conclude this direct examination. So this is the remainder of the prosecution. It says, last couple questions, Mr. Baker. When Sussman came into you and had the meeting in your office, did you suspect, did you suspect that he might be working for a political client? which is my question, right? That's like, if you're a juror, you're sitting there going, these guys are friends. They've been to all the conferences together. They've been hanging out. Why would you believe him, Jim, if he came in and said, I'm not here on behalf of Clinton? Wouldn't you just go, yeah, right. Bro, are you serious? I know who you are. So why did you not even suspect it, Jim? 
Did you suspect it? He says, no. Prosecutor asks, why not? Baker says, because he said he was coming there on his own to help the Bureau and not on behalf of any political client. Not on behalf of any client. Baker says, so I knew Michael. I trusted Michael. I believed Michael and I went forward on that basis. Perfect answer, right? For, for, for the prosecutor, not a good answer for Sussman. I trusted him. He told me that he was here on his own. I knew the man and I believed him. Prosecutor just lets that mic drop right there. Good way to end a direct exam. Thank you very much, Mr. Baker. And you know, this is something that you wanna leave sort of on a high note on a direct exam. And he does. He says, I trusted Michael. I believe Michael. I went forward on that basis. I had no reason to believe that he was lying to me. And so that's why I didn't think twice about it. Okay. All right. Very good. So that's the end of the direct exam for Jim. James Baker, FBI counsel. Now we get a substantial cross-examination here. And we'll spend a little time on this because it's pretty solid. And it's uh, something that continues on into this morning. So we're going to get through a lot of this before we get into Robbie Mook. But now... The defense is up representing Michael Sussman. Remember, we have Sean Berkowitz and he jumps in. He says, look, I've got a lot of ground to cover here. I ran this morning, though, so I'm in good shape as well. He announces that. To get through this, we're going to go quickly, but we're going to take some time. And James Baker says, I ran, too, so I'm all set. Oh, good Lord, you two get a room frolicking around DC, probably skipping around downtown together. All right. So then Berkowitz says, all right, Mr. Baker, let's start eating. We've never met before, have we, sir? That's correct. And do you remember how many times you've been interviewed by the prosecution? Baker says, no, I do not remember. And uh, the defense says, well, if I told you it was over 10, would that surprise you? Baker says, no, not really. Okay. Uh, I don't know what the accurate number is. So 10 sounds fine. And the defense says, all right, Jim, let's test your memory a little bit, okay? Being very direct here, a little bit adversarial, a little confrontational. And this is a little bit new for the defense because the defense really up until this part has had a couple FBI agents that really weren't involved in anything other than being an expert witness and somebody who did the analysis on the back end thumb drives. But then we had Laura Sego and then we had Mark Elias, which were all basically defense witnesses. And so we've seen a lot of patty cake playing between the defense and the government's witnesses. Just they gave Mark Elias, oh, what's your opinion on Donald Trump? And he's like, well, uh, how much time do we have? I'd like to take it all. And the prosecution was just sitting there like, yeah, take whatever you need. Just go on, Mr. Mr. Elias. Oh, good. Yeah, it's another one. Perfect. So the defense now is getting a little bit confrontational. We're going to test your memory a little bit here, huh? All right. Baker says whatever. How many times this last month have you met with the prosecution? And what's he trying to do? It's all about memory. James Baker doesn't remember what happened at that meeting. He has no idea. It happened six years ago. And Sussman did tell him he was there with a client, but Baker's just too stupid to remember it. That's why. Right. And he also just miscommunicated it to uh, Tricia Anderson and Bill Priestep, and they wrote it in their notes incorrectly. So almost this entire cross-examination, folks, if I could just say one word, memory. That's all it is. It's going to just be this big litany of trying to make Jim Baker look like he can't remember anything. And we're also going to see that they're going to try to say, you trust Michael, right? And he's reliable and he's, you know, authoritative and he's credible on all of those things. But let's see, prosecutor directly probing it and asking him like gotcha questions. Okay, like you can't remember what happened six years ago. Let me ask you what happened last month. See if you get that one. How many times did you meet with the prosecution team last month? He says, uh, in the last month, I think twice. Prosecutor, or the, the defense is like, okay, that was May 6th, correct? I don't remember the dates, but I'll take your word for it. Well, when was the most recent, Jim? He says two and a half weeks ago. Defense is like, you got that one too. Darn it. All right. Because if he didn't, he was going to correct him on that. And you testified yesterday that this gentleman over here, Mr. Sussman, is your friend. Is that right, Jim? Yes. And you weren't here to do him any damage. You were just here to answer his questions, right? Baker says, I don't think I said that first part. That you weren't here to do him any damage? I don't think I said that. I think I said I'm here to answer questions truthfully. And the defense says, but you, it's your investigation, you said. You said, I'm just here to answer questions, right? It's Mr. DeFilippis' investigation, and you're just here to answer the questions. Is that what you said? He says, I'm here to answer the questions. And the defense says, okay. And on behalf of Mr. Sussman, uh, we requested to meet with you. 
you know that we requested to meet with you. And he says, well, I understand that, but I delegated those decisions to my lawyer. They introduce an exhibit. And what the defense is doing here is they're introducing a letter that they sent over to a guy named Daniel Levin, who happens to be Mr. Baker's lawyer. Baker's lawyer is there, but not in court today. He gets a letter though from Sussman's defense team. And the Sussman defense team is putting this on the screen and they're saying, hey, Jimbo, we sent a, a message over to you and your lawyer saying, we need to talk to you. You remember that? Oh no, I delegated that to my lawyer. He does whatever. And they say, oh, well, let me show you the letter we sent him. And they slap that up on the screen. And then they say, uh, Mr. Baker, let me read this letter to you. It says, dear Mr. Baker, we are counsel to Michael Sussman. We understand that you've met with special counsel Durham and the prosecutors a number of times. We would very much appreciate the same courtesy and right to request a meeting with you at your convenience. Mm. Oh, so you're a government witness. How about you come over and talk to us now? We'd like to schedule just a voluntary interview with you. Nothing mandatory. We're not gonna go out and get a subpoena for this or anything. Don't be crazy. But since you're meeting with the Durham people voluntarily, you're surely gonna come meet with us, right? Cause that would be fair. We believe such a meeting with Mr. Sussman would be helpful as we continue to prepare his defense. We would be pleased to meet with you anytime, any location that is best for you. Sincerely, Sean Berkowitz. Now, the reason they sent this letter is not because they thought that Sussman was going to be meeting with them. Of course, his lawyer is going to say, don't you meet with them? No, <laughs> that's not going to happen. And they said no, and there was no meeting that took place. This letter is not because, well, they would have taken the meeting if they got it. But this letter is to, is to make this point to the jury that he's not being very fair, is he? He met with the Durham people and the prosecutors, but they sent him this very nice, pleasant letter. They said, we'll meet you anywhere, anytime, whatever's best for you, you just let us know. And that James Baker, he's so biased against Michael Sussman that he didn't even help them with a simple meeting. And the defense says, did your stinking lawyer show that letter to you, sir? Did he tell you we wanted to meet with you? And Baker says, no. And the, and the defense says, what kind of lawyering is this? He says, are you aware of a request to meet with us? Did you know we wanted to meet with you? Baker says, I delegated the decisions and the interactions with respect to meeting with you to Dan. And I let Dan make those decisions on my behalf, which is again, the right answer. So the defense gets a little bit tricky here. They're trying to squeeze this one by. They ask a question. They, they say, oh, okay, Jim. So you delegated that to your lawyer? Great. Uh, did you say, hey, I'd like to meet with the defense to give them an equal opportunity because Michael is a friend, right? Try to throw that one out there. So it's it, they're saying, Jim, you didn't even tell your lawyer that I'd, I'd like to meet, meet with Michael because he's a friend of mine. You didn't even say that. And the defense is objecting. I'm sorry, the prosecution is objecting hard. Objection, your honor. Calls for speculation and the court sustains that. Not an appropriate question. You know, you're asking him to sort of speculate about what he was thinking and, and uh, potential conversations about what he said to his lawyer. And it's also asking about the attorney client <laughs> privilege stuff. You, you didn't talk to your lawyer about appearing it's all protected and privileged. The defense knows that, but thus far the prosecution really, I don't think has really made almost any substantive objections. And so he was trying to see if he could squeeze that one through and he got caught. So then the defense changes gears and says, all right, so Baker, you worked at the FBI. You know what it's like to be under criminal investigation, right? And you know what it's like to be under criminal investigation by this man, don't you? Who is this man? Oh, it's Mr. Durham, John Durham. He's sitting right over there. <laughs> uh, in fact, sir, and they talk about this prior investigation, right? Now I wanna fast forward through a lot of this because Baker was under investigation for a long time and there were many investigations going round and around and around and we go. At one point, Durham was investigating him for something else, and then that got closed. And, you know, they were investigating multiple facets of this before they decided to file charges against Sussman. But again, I want to show you the theme of this entire cross-examination, right? So we don't need to get into the details as much as we do need to identify the theme. And again, in that second investigation with Durham, they bring us all right back to memories. Having problems with some of these memories, aren't you? Memories are a difficult thing, asks the defense, aren't they, sir? And Baker says, well, that's a difficult question to answer. That depends. And so the defense says, well, let me explain to you why memory is hard. Even today, you testified to some things that were different than what you've said in the past, correct? Mr. DeFilippis took you through those items. We read through all of the testimony and we went through all of the differences. The prosecution did that for us. 
And he says, yeah, and the IG statement was certainly different from what I've testified to today and yesterday. Yes, I acknowledge that. And the defense says, so let's talk about some of these other things that are incorrect. Saying that Mr. Sussman had cybersecurity clients, that's inconsistent, correct? Baker says, it's inconsistent with what I've said. Yes, that's right. So we're talking about events that are from September of 2016, right? Yes. And although I wasn't a math major, jokes this defense lawyer, we're well over five years past that time, right? Right. And we're going to do some exploring of memory and kind of take you through that because you've talked about this a lot, haven't you? Yes, I have. And with respect to being under investigation, Mr. Baker, you were under investigation at one point under the OIG, right? Yes. And that interview took place in December 2021 and it's still open. No, it's closed, right? Like I said, number of other investigations taking place. And so they go through a lot of those. They talk about the law fair. They talk about the Brookings Institute. They're just sort of trying to show discrepancies between one record from of the past and a newer record and saying these things just don't match. And therefore, you have a memory problem. A lot more conversations about the IG today. Berkowitz now asks, says, look, I believe you testified at one point, Mr. Baker, that there was a 30 minute meeting with Sussman in September of 2016, right? Yes. You testified for about four over five hours about that meeting and other things. Today, says Baker, yes. Yeah, today, yeah, I think that's right for about, over about four hours. And you're a lawyer, right, sir? Yes, sir. And you were the general counsel at the FBI, correct? Yes, sir. You were not an agent, correct? Not a special agent, correct? You weren't an investigator, correct? Correct. It was not part of your job to manage investigations, correct? That's directly, that. He, and Baker says that's not directly correct. As I said earlier, it was the job of the Office of General Counsel to conduct oversight and investigations, but not to run them. That's right. And so the, pro, the defense says it wasn't part of your job to either manage or conduct investigations. That was for others, right? Correct. So a lot of that. Jim Baker goes through some other records. And again, we're getting to some more sort of indented Q&A, which means that we're, we're reading transcripts. And then they ask about the role in the situation. More detail. Sussman texted you the night before, September 18th, right? Yes. You'll take the meeting with him on the 19th. Yes. And you testified today that you spoke for about 30 minutes at that meeting. And you got some thumb drives and some papers. And you didn't review those, correct? He says, well, I think I flipped through the papers pretty quickly. Did you review them at all substantively, sir? Says the defense. Not really. No. You didn't evaluate them either, correct? Correct. In fact, you wanted to get rid of them as quickly as possible, didn't you? That's correct. And you didn't want to have evidence, did you? That's also correct. And in fact, sir, the extent of your interaction with him was really short and cordial, wasn't it? Yes. And you wanted to avoid becoming a witness. And how well did that work out for you? Baker says, not very well. Defense says he made some statements, but you didn't want to conduct either an interview or a deposition of him at that time, right? Right. So, and then Baker chimes back in. He says, look, excuse me. Once I realized that the meeting, what, once I realized what the meeting was about and that Michael was giving me information, that changed my calculation about the interaction. So I wanted it to be over as quickly as possible and to get rid of this material as quickly as possible. So it changed once the meeting got started. Defense says, okay, all right. So you took information in, you handed it off to Mr. Priestep. Is that right? Somebody came in and got it. And James says, somebody came in and got it. That's correct. Defense asks, you didn't follow up on any of the follow-up factual investigation, correct? I did not do the investigation. That's correct. But you called Sussman back on the 21st to see if he would give you the name of that reporter from the New York Times, right? Jim says, I can't remember the dates, but yes. And Sussman called you back and did give you the name of the reporter? Baker says, yes. And after that, it's fair to say that you didn't talk with Mr. Sussman about Alpha Bank at all in 2016 or 17, correct? About the substance of the allegations not just about the allegations, but the substance. Baker says, I think that's right. Yes, 100% sure, pretty sure. What's pretty sure? He says, well, you know, I've had multiple conversations with Michael over a period of time, and I'm thinking about the years that you just framed, and that was when I was still at the FBI, so I don't think that I had other substantive conversations with Michael about that during this time, about the Alpha Bank in, in allegations. The defense says, you didn't interview him. No, I didn't. And you didn't issue any subpoenas or cause subpoenas to be issued for him. No, I didn't. And you didn't ask to speak with the cybersecurity experts either. Right? Right. And other than that, you talked to the New York Times, didn't you? Says, yes, I did talk to the New York Times twice. I described that earlier. And that wasn't to collect information though, right? Right. And the extent of your involvement in this 
was talking to Bill Priestep and handing the materials off. He says, well, when uh, I had interactions with the New York Times, I got briefings from Bill and I was learning about what was going on in the investigation, what the ultimate result was. Defense says, so you were in receive mode, but you didn't do anything affirmatively. And he says, other than interact with the New York Times, that's right. And this is good here, right? This is where the defense is sort of hammering this point home, saying, sir, you have no personal knowledge of whether Mr. Sussman was acting on behalf of a client or not acting on behalf of a client at that meeting. Is that right? Baker says, I have no personal knowledge about that. So you're not here to testify about that, correct? Correct. Now, very, very nuanced difference here, right? They're talking about, you're sort of splitting hairs on some of this stuff, talking about the difference between what Michael Sussman told James Baker, which is I'm not here on behalf of another client, and whether James Baker actually knew that. Okay, so this can be confusing, like at a quick reading, like this line of questioning might be very confusing for a juror. They're saying here, well, I thought that James just said that, that Sussman showed up and didn't say whether he was there on behalf of a client, yes or no. But here he's saying, I don't have any knowledge about whether he's there on behalf of a client. But what they're talking about is Jim actually having knowledge of what Michael Sussman knew. Did you know, like one way or another, whether he was actually there for somebody else? No, I didn't. But he's only saying that I knew what he told me, and that's what I was relying on. So a little bit of a nuance there, but that type of stuff happens very quickly. And so you have to wonder if the jury really catches it. We get a different question from the defense. It says, so when Mr. Sussman reached out to you, he said it was time sensitive and urgent. Correct. And you trusted Sussman, right? Yes, I did. And you knew him and you believed him to be ethical, right? Right. And you believed that you wouldn't have, he wouldn't have brought you information if he didn't believe it was credible himself, right? Right. And the fact that Sussman was coming on his own and not for a client didn't factor heavily in your decision to meet with him. Isn't that right, sir? Tried to squeak this one through. And Baker doesn't let that happen. One more time on the question. You see this? You sort of call this like a yes chain. You get a bunch of yeses. And you can do this in sales too or really any other area where you want to negotiate. You get people to start saying yes, 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 yes a bunch of times. And then they're just kind of preconditioned to say yes the next time. Isn't that right? Yes. Isn't it right? Yes. Isn't it right? Yes. Isn't it right? Yes. And isn't it right that Michael, if he were coming on and not for a client, saying that didn't factor heavily into your decision. Baker says, well, I would say that it did factor into my decision to meet with him because he said he just wanted to help the Bureau on something that was sensitive and time sensitive. And so because Michael was a friend and I trusted and had confidence in him, I was more than willing to meet with him if he thought he had something that would help the Bureau. And the defense doesn't really like that. They wanted him to continue to say yes there. And they say, all right, so let me clarify this for you. The reason that you decided to meet with him were that it was time sensitive and sensitive and you trusted him, right? Correct. The fact that Sussman stated specifically in his message that he was acting on his own and not for a client did not factor heavily into your decision to meet with him. Correct. Tries it again. Tried to ask that one again. And the, uh, the, the baker says, I disagree with that. I already disagreed with that. All right. Do you remember speaking with these folks in March of this year by these folks? We're talking about the prosecution team, Mr. DeFilippis. He says, yeah, I remember meeting with them in March. Okay, and in March of this year, is it not true, Jim, that you told them that you do not believe that the fact that Sussman stated specifically in his text that he was acting on his own favored heavily into your decision? You told them that. And then we have a little bit back and forth here. Can you repeat the first part of that question? And the defense does repeat it. And so I want to spend a quick minute sort of breaking this out. Baker, what the defense is doing here is saying that Baker met with the prosecutors previously. Part of that previous meeting, they were recording that meeting. It's all you know, part of a transcription or maybe the defense was there. I don't know the details, but the defense knows about the conversation. In that conversation, apparently James Baker, FBI said that whether he was coming on behalf of a client or not on behalf of a client, meaning Sussman, he, apparently he said something like it didn't weigh favorably or weigh heavily on his decision to meet with him. So the defense is trying to impeach him with that prior statement. They're trying to say, oh, you're being very inconsistent now. You know, when you met with the prosecutors, you said it didn't weigh heavily on you, whether he was there for a client or not. But now you're saying it did weigh heavily on you and it was material. Back then it wasn't material. Now it's material. So are you lying then? Or are you lying now? Which is it? Liar. And they're having a conversation. They're confused. I'm sorry. What's your question? 
So the defense says you told them, okay, you told the prosecutors on March 4th of 2022 something. And he says, look, sitting here today, I don't recall telling them that. Okay, I don't recall that. So, all right, well, let me refresh your recollection there, Jimbo. Why don't we pull up 302 of the meeting? And he says, yeah, sure. Yeah, pull it up. I haven't seen that 302 before, but all right, well, we're just going to orient the jury and we're going to present it and put it up there. What is a 302? He says, it's a report of an interview. And the defense asks, when a witness is interviewed by the FBI, an agent is there to take notes, right? It's a fact witness. And then you put it into a report, don't you? Yeah. And you didn't do that though with Mr. Sussman, right? Correct. Oh, the defense attorney's like, oh, see, he didn't do, he didn't follow protocol. It says, so let's take a look at this one. Number three, paragraph two. I'd ask you to read paragraph two just to yourself, sir. You don't have to read that out loud for us here, but just refresh your recollection. It says, is that the one that's showing? He says, that's the one that's shown. You can read the whole paragraph, but I'm looking at the third line, the third, fourth, and fifth lines. Read that to yourself. And then I'll ask if that refreshes your recollection about what you told the FBI that day. Baker says, yeah, one second, let me read this. All right, brief pause. Baker picks his head up. He says, all right, what's your question, sir? Defense says, Berkowitz, does it refresh your recollection that on March 4th of 2022, you told the FBI and Mr. DeFilippis that you didn't believe the fact that Mr. Sussman stated specifically in his text that he was acting on his own and not for a client factored heavily into your decision to meet with Sussman the next day. You said you didn't believe it weighed factored heavily into your decision, right? Baker says, I don't recall making that statement sitting here today. Defense says, and now it's your testimony that that's not accurate, is it? You're saying that that's not true. Baker says, it is my testimony today that as I think about it today, that's not accurate. It changed. And that was a meeting not too long ago, right? That was back in 2022, March 4th, 2022. So a lot has changed pretty quickly. Back then in March 4th, you said it didn't weigh heavily. And now you're saying it does weigh heavily. Very, very interesting. So they have a couple questions about the different meetings and the interviews talking about pretrial preparation said, I agreed to talk to the prosecutors saying that they wanted the material talking about us code saying that when he testified, he knew it's a crime to make a false statement to the FBI and that he still believes Sussman to be ethical, credible, somebody who was honest, somebody that you had years of interactions with, right? So this is sort of a, a string of compliments that the defense is trying to show the jurors. He's Michael Sussman's ethical. He's credible. He's honest. He's got years of interactions and background. And now he's suddenly being thrown under the bus. We go back. We have a couple of questions and a couple of dates. Now he draw, pulls out a, a whiteboard. He's going to start drawing this stuff out and watch what he does with this. This is kind of fun. He says, all right, so we go back to this meeting 19th of September. And he asks him, let's start with the elephant in the room. What's your testimony about what Mr. Sussman told you relative to clients, right? And the defense attorney now has the big uh, whiteboard and the marker or the Sharpie up there, the dry erase. And Baker says at the meeting in person or on September of the ninth, uh, on September 19th, defense says, yes, Baker says, okay, my testimony here today is that on the meeting on September 19th, Sussman is, he said that he was not there on behalf of any particular client or words to that effect. And the defense is like, oh, perfect. Oh, he says, now it's words to that effect. Oh, okay. Hmm. Well, this is fun says not there on, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. The Philippist chimes in, objection, your honor. Don't badger the witness. All right, he says that, you know, words to that effect and, and the defense attorney is being a little bit, you know, kind of rude. Oh, words to that effect now, your testimony's changing in real time. Court says overruled, but Berkowitz kind of, kind of gets it. He's like, all right, I understand. Like, I'm not gonna do that anymore. I was being a little bit aggressive, but overruled, but the judge probably gave him the old, you know, hey, be nice and behave yourself over there. And he's like, all right, I understand. So then Berkowitz gets back on his horse and says, again, I'm paraphrasing, not there on behalf of any particular client, correct? You see, he left out the part about words to that effect, right? He got rid of that part. Baker says, yes, sir. And he says, is that what you're 100% sure of? Because yesterday in the testimony, Baker said, I'm 100% sure that Sussman told me not here on behalf of another client. Yes, sir, 100% sure. 
right? 100% sure. Yes, sir. So some more bad testimony for the defense. They spent some time talking about this, talking about the hack, 30 minutes of the time. How long, what, how do you know it was that length of meeting? Well, the calendar entries tell me that. Talked about cyber experts, talking about news organizations, the defense attorney still writing all this stuff down. Who had worked on this material? Uh, he says, no, any names, anything ring a bell? He says, I got Mr. Bell Mr. Bellavin, Ms. Bellavin, Mr. Blaze, and Mr. Landau, all people who may have worked on this. But I don't remember anything about vouching for the information. So the defense says, all right, your testimony here today is that on September 19th, Sussman told you that Bellavin, Blaze, and Lando vouched for the information that he came with. So when he came, so the defense is now trying to sort of say that, well, Baker is saying, and the prosecution is saying that this was material. This lie was material. The FBI would have done something differently had they known that Sussman was there on behalf of the clients, saying that. It was about the integrity of the information. This is an integrity of information question. So now the defense is changing over to that. Okay, well, now that your memory's bad, let's talk about the integrity of the information. Maybe it was actually very valid information because we got three people there that are vouching for it. And so you could have done something with it regardless of that external. In other words, if you're blaming, if you're saying that your materiality as an FBI agent is based on bias or, or, or a conflict of interest, the information can still be good and that can overrule the conflict of interest, right? Like for example, let's say, so what? Let's say if Sussman was in fact working for Hillary, but the information that he brought was all true, right? The conflict of interest of Sussman may have overcome the true information, but both were wrong. He actually was a liar and the information was also erroneous. So now you've got sort of you know two bad things. But here, what the defense is trying to do is to say, well, no, the information is not garbage. It actually was valid. It actually is reasonable because these three people put it all, they vouched for it, right? And you were there and they have vouched for it directly to you, Mr. Baker, did they not? Baker says, I don't recall. Sitting here today, I, don't not, I do not recall him saying those experts had vouched for this material. And the defense says, are you saying it didn't happen? He says, I'm saying sitting here today that I do not recall him saying that those folks whose names I knew had vouched for this material. So the defense is trying to sort of, you know, rebuttress the material and they're not getting anywhere with it. Now, the defense does this with the whiteboard, right? This is kind of fun. And this is a little good move here. He says, all right, so he's scribbling all over this whiteboard. It's all messy all over the place. And he probably looks like a big jumbled mess with, you can't see anything. And it's all just, it's messy probably for just to, to, to make this point. He says, now, Mr. Baker, one of the reasons I'm having to write this down on this whiteboard is because you didn't take notes at the meeting. Oh, <laughs> so let me ask you a question. Did you take any notes at the meeting, sir? And he says, not to my recollection, no, right? So he's like, I had to write this down for you because you can't even take notes. Defense says, you're pretty confident of that? He says, yeah, I'm very confident of that. 100% you didn't take notes? And he's using his own language against him, right? Because he said 100% during his direct exam. So he's taking that language and he's repurposing it for the defense. 100%, oh, 100%, oh, 100%. Yes, and you don't recall him taking notes either. Sussman taking notes? No, I think he was speaking most of the time. And you were at the FBI headquarters, right? Big Hoover building, littered with agents. You could have gotten any other agent to come with you into that meeting, couldn't you? Uh, he says, yeah, I mean, I could have. I could have called Bill in, but... If he was available, I could have asked him to come to that meeting, but I guess I could have. And you were general counsel of the FBI. If you wanted an agent in a meeting, you could have gotten one in a minute, couldn't you? He says, well, I think it's harder than what you're saying. I mean, there's a lot of people delay and they're working and they're, uh, you know, playing around the Where's Waldo coloring books over there. So it's, you can't just go in and grab an FBI special agent. It's ridiculous. And the defense says you testified on direct, sir, that you didn't have an agent there because you didn't want them to know what Sussman was talking about. He could have been a confidential source. He could have been bringing something that implicates the FBI. And the defense says that's a very interesting excuse. But once he showed up and told you what he had, you didn't say, well, you know what, Michael, thanks very much. Let me get an agent. I want to talk about this a little bit more, right? He says, I didn't do that. Defense says you didn't even try. I didn't even try. That's correct. In the middle of the meeting, no, I didn't even try. So he's trying to say, you know, you could have kept a better record on this thing. Now you're saying you're 100% sure, but you didn't write it down. I had to write it down here on a whiteboard for you. And you can't remember anything. You see, it goes on. They're going back to the 19th. 
talking about different forms. He can't remember a lot of this. Remember, oh yeah, this is this is a whole section on the chain of custody. They talk about sort of what happened with the thumb drives after the fact. A lot of this is interesting and I think, you know, sort of moderately important, but it's after the fact, right? It's after the lie took place. And so we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. And the judge finally says, should we take a break? Yes, judge, let's do that. Uh, he steps down. They come back. They talk about some exhibits being admitted twice. And uh, we pick back up. They come back from their testimony. Let's see, refresh recollection. Conversation with Bill. And again, all this is sort of after the fact. He says this again, 100%. You gave a percentage on the meeting. Over, a, and that's some time ago, right? A long period of time happened a long time ago, right, Mr. Baker? Yeah, it happened five years ago, more than five years ago. So it's, it's, still, it's just still the same theme that we're on. Memory, memory, memory. All the memory is bad. Four minute call. Eventually we figured that out. You probably spoke to your executive assistant, 1105, another phone call, and then we get crossfire hurricane. Now the prosecutor, the defense is now saying, look, we're going through all this chronologically as fast as I can. I'm going to go, I'm going to fast forward now to March of 2017. And we spent a lot of time on this one. If you go back over to the mind map, there is an issue, an open issue in this case about this specifically. The March 17th notes or the March 7th, was it March 7th? Let's see here. Yeah, March, March of 2017. There were these notes that took place. There was a meeting that took place after Donald Trump was elected at one of these meetings. Somebody there wrote a note that looks like this that says an attorney, meaning Sussman, brought to the FBI on behalf of his clients. OK, so in March, somebody made a note that said that Sussman brought brought the information on behalf of clients, which is different than what he's being charged with right now, saying that he brought information specifically not on behalf of another client. So sometime in the six months after the September meeting, now March, 2017, we get a different changing story. And the defense is gonna have a lot of fun with that. They really want those notes to come in. So they say, uh, you didn't speak with him again about the matter in 2016 or 17. He says, look, to the, that's the best of my recollection. Did you go to a meeting then though, back in March of 2017? Defense asked specifically, I'll be as clear as I can about this. There was Trisha Anderson, there was yourself, there was Jim Rybicki, Carl Gaddis, Andy McCabe, Bill Priestep was there, Mary McCord, Tasha, and Guahar were there. Dana Puente was the acting AG. You remember that meeting there, Jim? He says, only vaguely. What do you remember about it? They get some documents admitted. They talk about the acting attorney general, Dana Boenti, the highest acting AG, who is Andy McCabe. He was deputy director. Who's Jim Ryecki, chief of staff to the director of the FBI, James Comey. They talk about Ms. Guahar. Absolutely ethical. Now, you said you had a vague recollection. Can you tell the jury what your recollection was? Some sort of briefing about a number of cases. They move something else into exhibits. There's a document. It says a brief for the department, uh, probably the, the deputy uh, attorney general. It says focus on Russians, right? The more we can talk about Russia in this trial, the better for the defense. Here we see the note. It says attorney brought to the FBI on behalf of a client. Do you see that, sir, Jim? Yes. You recall anybody at the meeting ever saying that? Do I recall saying, say that again, sir? He says, do you recall anybody at the meeting saying that the information about Russia and Alpha Bank had been brought to the FBI by an attorney on behalf of his client? He says, I don't recall that. I don't recall saying that and, or, or, or anybody saying that. I don't recall that. Did you see the notes from Bill? No. First time seeing the notes? Is your testimony influenced by anything that came outside of the courtroom today? No. I'm giving you the best testimony I can from my recollection. I don't remember that. I don't recall providing the briefing. No, I don't remember that. No, I don't remember doing that. To the contrary, right? Sort of the opposite of what we had yesterday when we were dealing with Mark Elias. Defense asks, and when you voluntarily gave information to Congress, you understood you were under oath. He says, actually, I don't think I was under oath, but I know it's a crime to make false statements, but you tried to be careful. I did try. And you tried to be truthful. Yes, I did. And you tried to be as honest and yes, I, okay. And so they go back through all of this. Now take a look, right? This is just like they did on the direct exam. They're going to go back through all of the congressional testimony. We see all of this indentation. They're going to read through the whole stinking thing, just like we did on the direct exam. And he's going to just beat him up over the whole thing. Right now he's talking about Mr. Levin, Mr. Jordan, 
Inspector General, Mr. Levin, John, all of the congressional testimony. So we're not going to go through that again, right? It's the, it's the opposite side of the coin that we spent talking about on direct. We see down here at the bottom, looks like there's another text message. Somebody sends a text message or sends you a piece that says, our Michael Sussman is an honorable man coming from John Devaney. Do you remember whether you read this or not? You don't remember whether you read this? He says, correct, I don't remember. But you know Sussman sent it to you. Yes, I do know that. What does it say? This is a message from Sussman. It says, as Perkins Coy previously stated, Sussman's meeting with the FBI. So it's just sort of the statement. Baker says, I don't remember reading that. And why did Michael send this to you? He says, I don't know. You'd have to ask Michael. Michael Sussman. So the rest of this, let's see what else we got. A lot more sort of letters, briefly summarizing some things, asking him about the investigation with the IG, which I think is a little bit far removed from the actual case. I skimmed through this earlier, and I think I highlighted the things I wanted to cover. So here is another contradictory statement. They ask him, do you remember telling in June 2020 the prosecutors that you don't remember at the time whether you were aware he was representing the DNC? Yeah, so this is a good section on his memory, and I wanted to catch this. Baker says, over time, I have had a hard time placing exactly when it was I learned about this information. So, he says, I'm sitting here today based on Bill Priestep's notes. That tells me that I must have learned that before the meeting in September. And the defense says, okay, so listen. Your memory, it looks like, has evolved. This has actually evolved based on seeing other people's notes. And just to, to, to refresh our memories on this, they're talking about this relationship in the mind map. After, after James Baker, who we're listening to now, met with Sussman, he had conversations with these two people, Bill and Trisha. Bill actually wrote notes that look like this here in this top uh, right area, said not doing this for any client. We know that Baker, for a long time, has had sort of conflicting uh, reports about how all this works, or what his memory is telling him. And the defense is really honing in on this now. They say, look, so your memory then has evolved based on seeing other people's notes. You didn't remember, you saw Bill's notes, and now your memory has changed. Can you explain that for us, Jim? And he does, he says, look, I know that I was in a briefing where other FBI officials discussed that Michael was representing the DNC and the Hillary Clinton campaign, in some fashion in connection with the hack, which was a separate issue. I specifically and clearly remember that. I don't remember exactly when that was. So from looking at Mr. Priestep's notes, when there's a reference in there to the, I can't remember, I don't have the notes in front of me, but there's a reference to the entities. And so therefore that tells me, aha, I must have known it by that point in time. So I probably learned it in the summer of 2016 before the meeting. Defense says, but, at the meeting in June of 2020 with the FBI and Durham and DeFilippis, at that time, your recollection was that you did not remember and did not know at the time that Mr. Sussman met with you, that he was representing the DNC. So your, your story changed. Bill said, uh, uh, what's his name? FBI, James Baker says, if that's what the notes say, I can't see the part of the notes, so I'll take your word for it. You wanna see the notes? It's not really, don't need to see it. I don't remember them, even if you showed it to me. Defense asks him, do you remember asking or telling the Philippus and Durham that you recalled Sussman called you at work and that he needed to see Baker at Baker's office? Says, yeah, I remember that. I remember thinking Michael initiated this call. And the defense says, that was wrong, right? He says, yes, that was wrong. The defense jumps back in. Memories are a difficult thing. Are they not, Jim? You were wrong many times. You keep forgetting how things happen. And Jim says, uh, I don't know how to answer that question. Defense says, it's a hard thing to remember something from over five years ago, isn't it, sir? He says, as I said earlier, there are certain things that you can remember and certain things that are difficult to remember. I'm not a neuroscientist. I can't explain how human memory works. We need some neuroscientists and biologists to understand basic human functions, I guess. But this continues to go on, and I wanted to fast forward because he, I think, closes it out here. 
talking about this, talking about memory, right? Memories are hard. All of this is memory. I don't remember. Basically, what he's trying to do is to get him to say, I can't remember. I don't remember. Do you remember this? Not really. No, not really. No. Do you remember? No, I thought I, I thought that for a long time, but then it changed. And he's doing a good job of this. So if you just sort of skim through the transcripts, you can see, yeah. I don't remember another one. I remember that's what in general occurred. That's my memory. Do you remember? Again, I don't remember. So it's kind of the opposite. Rather than getting a bunch of people to say yes, 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 you get them to say, I don't remember, I don't remember, I don't remember, I don't remember many times. Doesn't make sense to me. Please repeat that. Defense asks, you told Durham and DePhilippus in June that you believe Sussman was credible for several reasons. So I don't really remember what you're talking about. Can't really pinpoint that. But he says, you said you believe Sussman was an ethical person. Yeah. And you remember telling them that you believe that he wouldn't have brought information to you if he did not seem it, think it was credible. And you remember telling him that the researchers who found the information thought it credible, right? And finally, you believed it was credible enough for the FBI to accept and review it, didn't you? And in addition, he had told you about a news organization and you had called him to get the name of the news organization and ask him follow-up questions about that. So, well, I don't know about that last piece, but I know that he, well, I guess he must have been in touch with Mr. Sussman. Yeah, that makes sense. And you have verified some of what he told you, didn't you? And you said that what he told you was correct, right? And this is, this is where he, he sort of fleshes out for us how his memory is working, and this is useful. He says, <clears throat> and so it's those notes that made you say it must have been that. So what the defense is asking him about, they're saying, the defense is saying, you didn't remember this, you saw the notes, and then the notes inserted the memory into your mind. There was nothing there. And then the notes, after you read them, you inserted that memory, the notes created the memory. Bill is, I'm sorry, Baker, it's been a long week, keep forgetting his name, says the notes and the questions triggered the memory. So the memory was sort of dormant. The notes and the questions triggered the memory. They weren't inserted by the notes. He says, my memory on this point sitting here today right now is clear. So he didn't remember, read the notes. Oh, now I remember clearly. Yeah, it's all here. And so currently sitting here today right now, it is clear. And I, you know, that's not good for the defense, right? He's, he's sort of doubling down every single time. The defense can't let this go. They say your testimony today about what happened at the meeting is aided insignificant, if not in whole part by the notes though, right? It's aided insignificant, if not wholly, by the notes. Try his question a little bit differently. And he says, uh, no, it was triggered by Bill's notes. And I have a sitting here today, I have a present recollection of what Michael said in the meeting. And the defense is like, they, they can't let this stick. They're like, Argh! but they say it's based on the notes, right? Like your memory is based on the notes. It's not your own memory. It's, it's layered on top of the notes. And Baker says, no, dang it. He says the notes and the very specific questioning that they, that I went through with Durham and his team, they asked me repeated very specific questions about this matter. And so that they are probing my memory about that and looking at Bill's notes. And it made me remember what I'm telling you today. And the defense says, oh my goodness, that sounds like it could be violent. Did they threaten you, sir, with anything based on the fact that you had previously told folks under oath or that you were subject to perjury, that there were inconsistencies? They threaten you if you don't cooperate, that they're going to prosecute you? Baker says, Mr. Durham and his team have never threatened me in any way. The defense is like, darn it, this is not going real well. They say, but you understood, sir, did you not? You're a lawyer, that if you said something that someone determined was false or under oath, if it was perjury, you could be prosecuted. You knew that, right? He says, yes, we did know that. And they go for a break there. They end it there. They say, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to wrap it up there and dismiss you for the evening, another long day. And so thank you for your patience. Don't talk about the case and have a great night. We'll see you all back here tomorrow. And that was the conclusion of that afternoon on May 19th on the Thursday. Shout out to Lorraine Herman, who is our amazing court reporter who brought us those transcripts. We have the best court reporters. We love to support our court reporters. And since we're done with that, let's take a quick pause. We'll do a little bit of a Super chat check in, see how some of these are going. And um, well, there's quite a lot of them. Let me take a little parched, uh, parched, parched break. Let's turn this chat on over here.
because we have a full full day ahead. We have all of April 20, May 20th. Michael Sussman, this transcript here. We got some amazing super chats coming in. Thank you for these, everybody. These are all going into the transcript dono fund. Transcript dough from Bootsy says you're awesome. Thank you. AC's in the house says thank you from a fellow Arizonan. We appreciate your commentary and your kindness in sharing these docs. Cheers to AC. I think I know who that is. Anthony Henson in the house with a dono. Malamute Aerospace with a dono. James Gutierrez just became a member over on YouTube. Charlie Delta says thanks for covering this case. Mark Mills with another super chat dono. Thank you, Mark. Another one from Malamute Aerospace. Scott Benedict's in the house with a transcript dono. Malamute says, release the hounds. Greetings from Monaco with three different emojis. Christina Malamon is in the house. Says, thank you for the great work. God bless. Nomad says, I went for a run. Equals, quote, I had my memory jogged. And that's a fun one. Yeah, they both are just like, yeah, I went for a run too. You get, you get a run? Get your run in? Yeah, I got my run. Perfect. We're going to make this all go very well. <laughs> And earlier today, we had some other ones come in that I jumped over. I apologize. Or, or rock seven says, get it, brother. Preach the truth for us. Starving the facts, starving for the facts. I think the close relationships of the jury and the plaintiff and the judge is going to end without conviction. Very well could be. It does feel like it's sort of uh, rigged problematically, doesn't it? With the jury, James Jarvis says, I know $5 isn't much. Every, it's a, it's a, it's a lot. That's a lot really. I mean, if you know, that's a lot. Thanks for going through all of this for us. I fear the jury leans left in DC and justice won't be served. Yeah, look, anything helps. Thank you for that. And if you can't make a contribution, don't feel badly about it. I appreciate you just being here and joining the show. Zulu's here says 2016 election defense fund. Also, the people desire an Elon gif, which I we had one for a while. But yeah, we got to get an Elon gift. I'll make that happen tonight, probably, or maybe maybe first thing tomorrow. But before the show, next time, we'll get an Elon gif. And K Bean's in the house talking about that one says we require an Elon gif and we'll do it. We'll, we'll do it. I don't know which one it should be, but we've got uh, maybe we'll do a poll on that in YouTube or over on locals. I don't know. Playing hookies here with a very generous super chat playing hooky. Number one, major dono to the transcript fund. And I appreciate that Richard Clark, another one with a very nice one, Tom Conwell, Richard Clark, Tom Conwell. Thank you very both, both very much. Zulu says, do you know any lawyers who could handle a class action suit against big transcript? Those vampires go too far. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know. Big transcript, you know, I don't know. Are you talking about the, the court reporters? Big tech, big transcript, big media. Those vampires go too far. I don't know what, I don't know what you're talking about, Zulu. You know, any lawyers who could handle no, we don't want to sue our court reporters. We have the best court reporters. They give us the transcripts. Thank you, Zulu, for both of your donos. And Bootsy's here with another one. Transcript Doe says, you're awesome. Thank you. So thank you, everybody, for those. And those are very useful. And I uh, we're going to jump back into the transcripts here because we have day two. Thank you, Teresa Salazar and everybody else who donates to the fund. All right. And so now that we're re-parched a little bit, We're going to put our reading pants back on, swallow appropriately the, the beverage, of course, <clears throat> clear the throat and jump into the transcripts. We're back. We are on day five. This is the Michael Sussman prosecution. John Durham, special counsel, is moving things along. This was the morning session. We can see Friday, May 20th, the case against Michael Sussman. Now, we're still missing. Oh, no, look, we have Mr. Kielty's back who's in session. And Mr. Kielty was the gentleman that we actually missed because he had a family emergency. So he is back in court. Let's make sure it was Mr. Kielty. I believe it was. Yeah, Kielty here. Yeah, family emergency. So he's back in court, which is good. Prayers to Mr. Kielty. Hope the family's doing well. The defense team's back in the house. Lisa was doing the transcripts this morning. And they're back on the case. We've got the Philippus. Good morning. Introducing everybody. Berkowitz doing the same. And who's back on top? Baker. Back up before the jury comes in. Juror eight, judge spoke with the manager. You're not going to lose your job. Don't worry about it. James Baker is back up on the stand. Now, Berkowitz, the defense attorney who was doing the cross-examination yesterday, is going to pick it back up. 
He says, all right there, Jim, going to give you a little roadmap of what we're doing. I'm going to sharpen my pencil a little bit. We're going to knock out the rest of what I got to get to today. We're going to talk about Bill. We're going to talk about Anderson and her notes. We're going to talk about the New York Times and get into whether it mattered. So that's kind of my roadmap. We're going to try to knock it out quickly. Do you remember meeting with them, the Philippus and Durham in 2020? We talked about that yesterday. So I don't remember a specific date, but yeah, we did talk about it. And that you had a meeting with Sussman back in September, 15 to 20 minutes. So I don't remember telling them that and they refresh his memory. Look at those four lines. So it does look like you, he says, it doesn't refresh your recollection. No. Do you deny you said that? He says, I don't remember what I said. Okay, let's talk about these notes. And these are the notes that we referenced in yesterday's session. These notes are pretty important in refreshing your recollection about what happened. Right, sir? Yeah. And I think you said yesterday that you were highly confident that your discussion with Bill occurred on the phone, right? And you remember meeting with Mr. DePhilippus in Durham and having conversations with them, details about what Sussman provided to you? He says, I don't remember that. And he's still sort of on the same theme, right? Memory, memory, memory. It does not refresh my recollection. I don't recall. Could somebody blow up the notes? He asks, do you remember the circumstances about the notes? They didn't provide me a copy of the notes. The defense finally says, I'm trying to figure out, maybe you can help me. You met with them on June 11th, June 8th. He says, I met with them multiple times. Do you remember whether you saw the notes? He says, I don't remember that, right? And so they blow up another notes. The attorney brought two. Did the FBI or anybody from the special counsel team show you these notes to try to refresh your memory? No, they didn't. And he's talking about these notes, right? Both of these are the Trisha Anderson and the Bill Pre-Step notes. If you want to look at them, they're both literally in here, right? This is Trisha Anderson's notes. No specific client, but a group of cyber academics. So we've referenced these many times. And they want these to go away because their, their, their argument is that Baker's memory is very reliant on them. Talking about credibility. Here's a question. Did Bill ask you who the cyber people were? Did he ask? Yes. I don't know if he asked or if I told him, but we did talk about it. They talk about Bill Priestep. He's a special agent. He's a senior official, been with the Bureau for 20 years. He's a lawyer in private practice. Michael's a lawyer in private practice. They talk to Trisha about Trisha Anderson's notes. They put those notes up. Trisha Anderson was the deputy general counsel. Do you remember being shown these notes in December? I don't recall when I saw those for the first time. Well, how about a recollection for the jury? He says it was, it was not at the same time as Bill's notes. I saw the two notes differently from each other. Do you have any recollection of the meeting? No, not really. And again, right, this is all intentional. You don't remember the meeting? I don't remember this specifically. That's correct. Let me be really clear. You are unaware of any direction from anybody in the FBI to keep Sussman's identity hidden from the team investigating Alpha, correct? That's correct. Let's talk about the New York Times. Pull up that exhibit. This is a September 22nd, 2016 document. We put this in the form of a question. It says you had a meeting with the FBI. Could you name the news organization? It's a little bit weird for a news organization to call them and ask them to hold something. Is that correct? Yes, it's unusual. As I think I said yesterday, it happened. So unusual, that's a fair word, I guess. So then on the 21st, you talked to Sussman and you said, I need to check with somebody. I'll call you back. Do you remember that? Yeah, that's my recollection. And you understood you're going to talk about cybersecurity experts, right? Yeah, that's my understanding. You know who Eric Lickblau is? Yeah. Well, I knew who he was, but I'm not sure that I've ever dealt with him. He won a Pulitzer Prize, didn't he? Yeah, I think so. And sometimes, and sometimes, I think you testified about this yesterday, but sometimes in order for the FBI to look into a serious national security concern, it's better the public doesn't know about it. And it's helpful that the FBI gets a heads up if the New York Times is going to publish something, right? That would, that would be helpful, wouldn't it, Mr. Baker? Yeah, that would be helpful. And so you spoke with Sussman and you got Lickblau's name. You reported it to some pretty senior people, didn't you? Yeah. Senior enough. I mean, it's Jim Comey. He was the director at the time. Yeah. And Andy McCabe, number two, right? Yeah. And so you thought it was all very serious. That's why you took it up to numbers one and two. 
And could the only person have told you any of this information, Michael Sussman? How many meetings did you have? He says two meetings. Yes, sir. Did you tell him to hold the story? So they're meeting back and forth with Lickblau, which of course is going to come in later on. Now we get to Robbie Mook with a direct exam. And so I, I want to make sure we spend a little bit of time on that because he starts this morning. So I kind of don't want to spend a lot of time on this stuff if it's sort of ancillary. Let's see if we can get another big question. He gave us the outline. He said at the end of his outline, he's going to ask why it all matters. And so let's make sure we sort of get that part. We've got a defense exhibit. What is this? Blow this one up a bit for me. No objection. Talking about a tweet. I think this is the first time I've introduced a tweet, Mr. Berkowitz. I'm glad we could be the first. Jim Baker at the Jim Baker. There's a tweet that's now being moved into evidence. It says, please contact your local FBI office or submit a tip electronically if you believe information that is dangerous to threaten national security official. So James Baker posted this tweet, your words, sir. And he posted this tweet back, it looks like in 2019. These words are taken, I think, from the FBI website. I put quotes on it and I posted it on the internet. So I believe I cut and pasted the words from the website into a tweet. And you believed them in 2019, didn't you? Did I retweet this? Oh, I tweeted it. I believe these words when I tweeted them. Yeah, I think that if people want to bring information about national security issues to the FBI, they should be able to do that. I took it from the website and I just posted the tweet. And you understood that there was suspicious connections between servers. That was the allegation. And there was a half inch stack of papers that Michael Sussman brought to you. Yes, sir, there was. And you understood those materials came from cybersecurity experts by Mr. Sussman, didn't you? Yeah. And you didn't do a substantive review? No, as I said, right? And they've, they've covered a lot of this already. You didn't ask your team, you didn't ask your team to do any work on this, to do any legal analysis? No, I did not. Got it. They talk about different types of confidential information and a skiff and where top secret stuff goes and the different levels of clearances and all of that. Did you know that Sussman had that level of clearance for over 20 years? And so they're doing a little credibility boostering here, booster to make Sussman look, you know, amazing, serious credibility. And he was very respectable. All right. You trusted him. He's a serious lawyer. He's a smart guy, serious national security experience, DOJ, top secret clearance, pretty reliable, right? Yeah. All the time in your mind. Yeah. Saw all of that. And so it's memory and credibility. Uh oh, we have a too many pronouns there. What, what's happening here? Question. Okay. And do you know that when Mr. Sussman went to the CIA and asked if they could speak to a cyber, one of the cyber experts, he says, I think I can make that happen. Baker says, wait, there's too many pronouns there. Can you just break that down for me? So he sort of rephrases the question. Okay. Well, as I said yesterday, says Jim, there are certain investigative activities that require approval by a lawyer, but generally speaking, 99% of the time, I'm not sitting there signing off on investigations. The FBI, if they need to start investigating, they can. They talk about technical file numbers and you know, this is pretty dry stuff. We have another exhibit. Matter being referred over to the DOJ. Get to the first page, Berkowitz. Moving another exhibit into evidence. What is this? Drafted by Allison Sands and Curtis Hyde. What is this? Case ID talks about Alpha Bank. This is a sensitive investigative matter. Do you see that? Involving SIM cards. And all this seems very just tangential to the entire criminal charge. Here we have another date relevant. Here's a document. It reads, on or about September 19th, FBI received a referral, unusually configured email server from Trump organization. In that referral, the DOJ provided the FBI with a white paper. Do you see that? Yeah. Mr. Sussman's name is not listed there, is it? It's not. And you don't know why his name wouldn't be there, do you? I do not know why. Okay, sir, would it be correct to say that the matter was referred to the DOJ? It was not the department of, I don't receive information at the DOJ. I received it from Michael. And you were shown this document at one point. Yes, I think that's right. I recall him saying that. And it's an FBI issue, right? You speak to Bill, he speaks to somebody, and he turns and he points it over to this, right? Yes. But we can also see classification on this first page It's because it's blacked out. Yeah, I'm not even sure really what they're trying to get after here. 
All right, so let's talk about Sussman coming back to you on September 19th. He indicated to you that he believed the information, told you in September he apparently showed someone else about this. All correct, yes. And he believed that these were serious concerns. That's my recollection, yes. And at this point in time in September, Russia had already hacked the DNC emails, right? Yes. Clinton already invited Trump. I'm sorry, the candidate Trump invited Russia to look at the 30,000 emails, right? He did that at some point. I don't remember the exact date. Okay, and if in fact there was an effort by Russia to communicate in some part with Trump, in your view, Mr. Baker, would that present a national security concern? Correct. At the time, yes. I would have thought that that presented a national security concern. And so they're trying to make this all seem very legitimate. Defense says, in fact, at the time, in September 2016, the FBI was already investigating allegations about this. Correct? Correct. This was brought up by another set of allegations. That's right. And it was a very high priority for you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And if there were a matter of actual national security, and if it were an actual newspaper article about to come out, the FBI would want a heads up, wouldn't they? Yes, they would. They'd want to investigate this, right? Yes. It's critically important they do that. I would say yes, because if an article is published, they could just start using another channel of communication very quickly. And Baker says, yes, the FBI would have a harder time doing its job. And when Mr. Sussman came to you, he told you he wanted to give you a heads up. Yes. And said an article's coming out. Yes. And when he came to you, he said he didn't ask you to do anything. Did you? Did he? That's correct. He didn't. He said, take whatever action you think is appropriate. Baker says, I don't remember if he exactly said that, but that was sort of the tenor of the conversation. And the defense says, well, sir, let's put up what you said yesterday. You said this yesterday, right? You said just yesterday that apparently you don't remember that happened yesterday. Okay, so they pull the transcripts up. Uh, question to Mr. Baker. And during the meeting, did you, what if anything, did you tell Sussman about what you would do? Did you have any asks of him? Baker said yesterday, so he presented that to me. I just took that information, but he didn't ask me to do anything. He just said, you know, well, he said, take whatever action you think is appropriate. So that's Baker's testimony. The defense just asked them about it. Something he said yesterday, apparently didn't even remember that. And that's the truth, isn't it? He says, yes, sir. Nothing further. We get a redirect exam from Mr. DePhilippus, who's going to try to clean all that up. Berkowitz makes an objection, overruled, restates the question said that facts were not in evidence. We're gonna skip the redirect because we have already listened to two sides of this and we don't need to hear this further. But I do wanna start with, let's see how this wraps up, Mr. Baker. A lot of redirect here, my goodness. Very big witness, but let's see how this wraps up because I wanna to get to Robbie Mook. And it just keeps going. They go to a sidebar, bench conference. They want five minutes of redirect. He raised some issues I think are work, worth going back on. Is there something DePhilippus raised outside the scope of your cross? He asked a number of hypothetical that were not contemplated by the thoughts, including this. He just showed the notes. He went over that in the meeting. It's going to be less than five minutes. I just want to redirect. Prosecutor objects. And the court ends it. We're going to leave it at that so they don't get a redirect. That's the end of the conference. So, uh, Mr. Baker, you're done. You're dismissed. Please do not discuss your testimony and have a good day. They take a morning break. We'll see you back here in 15 minutes. And just to establish, uh, elaborate, the judge talks to Mr. Berkowitz. They say, look, I usually don't allow recross unless the scope was exceeded. And I think everything that Mr. DePhilippus went into was within the scope of your cross. Berkowitz says, I understand. And not to argue any of it, it was the, I know, there were a couple of key points that given the argumentative nature I could have done, but I respect what you're doing and we're moving along. Court says, if we go down that road, it's gonna be a request for every witness and we're just not going to allow it. So no additional redirect comes out from the defense. And court asks, all right, everybody, who do we have next in here? Prosecutor says, your honor, I think we thought that now would be the time to have Mr. Mook from the defense side because we had accommodated and the court says, okay, yeah, very well. So I need to explain to the jury that we're going out of order and no rule 29 implications from taking evidence in the government's case. The government hasn't closed yet. So that's not a judge. I believe you can separate it out. Okay. And then afterwards, we're going to have Kevin P after Mr. Mook. And then we're going to go to Mark Chattison first. And then Kevin P the CIA agent afterwards. We get a couple of preliminary things. Berkowitz says, 
for the defense. Just briefly, Judge, before we get started, and I hate to make these predictions, I think that these next three witnesses will all be relatively short. We may finish early today, and I don't know if there are any other witnesses. We're certainly not aware of any. We'd be happy to finish early if that's where we end up. And the judge says, I'm sure the jury will appreciate that. And this transcript is only 159 pages, so it's actually a little bit of a shorter early uh, morning. But then the jurors come back. All right, please be seated. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. As I explained on Thursday, the defense is going a little bit out of order. The defense will present a direct examination. Wait a minute. Oh, okay, but because of some scheduling issues, we are now going to hear out of turn from one of the defense witnesses. So the order will be flipped. The defense will present the direct exam. The government, if it chooses, will present a cross exam and the defense may come back with a brief redirect. Okay, so we're putting on the opposite hat here for this. This is a defense witness. This is now, let's go back. This is now a witness that the the defense attorneys are calling, not the prosecutors. It's their witness. They're going to do the direct exam. Robbie Mook is this guy. He's the Hillary Clinton campaign manager at the time back in 2016. And the defense is calling him. So we got to put the hat on the other foot on this one. So let's get back into it. Uh, Mr. Bosworth is doing the direct exam on this one. Mr. Bosworth, we haven't heard too much from. Mr. Bosworth is the defense attorney down here in uh, the glasses. We see him here, Michael Bosworth. And did I have a photograph? I think I had a, uh, no, I didn't attach it anywhere. So Bosworth is doing the direct. Says, thank you, your honor. We're ready to go. Sussman calls Robert Mook up. Court says, all right, Mr. Mook, step right up. Good morning. Swear in, take your mask off. Good morning, Mr. Mook. Good morning. Now, says Bosworth, I can't remember. It's the first time I'm up here. Did you state and spell your name? It's Mook. M -O -O okay, got it. Please tell the jury what you do for a living. Says, currently I'm self-employed. I do consulting and I teach graduate students. All right, let's talk about the 2016 election. Do you have a role in it? Yeah, I was the campaign manager for Hillary for America. She says, I'm going to put a pin in that there for a minute. And prior to working for Hillary, did you work for anybody else? I want to just get a sense of what you've done. He says, yeah, all over the place. I am a Democrat through and through. I love this stuff. He says, after I graduated from college, I was a field director for Vermont. I worked on Howard Dean, John Kerry, a representative in Virginia. I worked for Hillary's 2008 presidential failed campaign. I ran some states for her. I was a political director at the DCCC, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. I ran a campaign for governor of Virginia, and then I ran Hillary. And all this work was for the Democrats, right? Correct. Or Democratic parties? Correct. And jumping back to Hillary Clinton, when did you begin work for her? April 2015. And what happened then? He says, well, we launched formally and announced the campaign, filed with the FEC, did all that stuff. And you worked for Hillary from that point on? He says, yes, until the end. I think it was mid-November when I came off a of payroll after they lost. Womp womp. After the election? Correct. Defense says, what were your duties and responsibilities? All sorts of stuff. Budget, financing, managing the staff, had a senior team. Strategic decisions need to be made. And when we do that, we go to John Podesta. John Podesta, the chair of our campaign, communications director, Jen Palmieri, Jake Sullivan, all sorts of other consultants who were involved. John Podesta's involved. And he says there was an official role with the FEC, Jen Palmieri, Jake Sullivan, you mentioned. He was the strategist. Currently, he's now the NSA over for the Biden administration because it's just one big party from one administration to the next. Campaign headquarters, where were those? He says, Brooklyn, New York. And how many people were on? He said, we started with 50, but by the end, five to 600 at the end of the campaign. And who worked? How many people worked for the campaign outside of headquarters? About 4,000, a lot of them. And are you nominally in charge of all of them? Yeah, nominally. Here's what a campaign manager does. I'm usually in the office until at least 1030, sometimes midnight, back-to-back -back meetings, a lot of issues on any given day. Did Perkins Coy play a role in this here, Robbie Mook? He says, yeah, they did. What was their role? Well, they were our general counsel for the campaign. And did you have lawyers that sat with you in Brooklyn at the headquarters? He says, well, yeah, we did. I recall in-house counsel. There were other lawyers, but I'm recalling right now there's only one in-house general counsel. Who was that? Oh, that was Deborah Fine. And Deborah Fine, we've already heard about. She testified earlier on in the trial. I think it was on day two. Deborah Fine was over... Wait a minute. Deborah Fine was on day three. Here's Deborah Fine. Deborah Fine was also general counsel 
for Hillary Clinton campaign advisor, worked on special projects, and there was an error. There was an own goal. DeFilippis didn't impeach her on something that he could have. The judge sort of uh, said, you missed the mark on that one. But that's who we're talking about. Who was your main contact over there? Mark Elias. Mark Elias, also very involved in the DNC. We learned about him. He is sort of that head honcho that looks like that guy. So they're going through and... This is why we created the entire branch up here. These are all the people that we're talking about. I don't have photographs for them just yet, but uh, I will over the weekend. And Ravi Mook is one of these people that really worked for Hillary for America. And here we see, how often did you interact with Mark? Well, at least a few times a week when, without getting into the substance like attorney-client privilege, what did you talk about? And he says, well, campaigns are heavily regulated. Everything from how we raise money to how our staffing is structured. Once we become a nominee, we had a relationship. And so we've got to hash through all these issues. What's the nature of the relationship between the DNC and the Democratic Party and all of these? He says, well, you know, once you're the nominee, you know, you get the resources of everybody. Everybody grows in the same direction. They do everything they can to try to get you elected. And you had a convention for this campaign, didn't you? Yes, we did in late July. And at that time, the main goal of the Democratic Party was to get Hillary installed as president. Is that right? That's right. Defense goes back to Perkins Coy. They say, you mentioned you dealt mostly with Mark over there. Did you ever interact with somebody named Michael Sussman? Robbie says, I don't recall interacting with him on the campaign. And are you familiar with a firm named Fusion? He says, I am now, but not at the time. And during the campaign period, did you know the name Fusion? He says, I did not. Are you familiar with the term opposition research, Robbie? Yes, I am. What is that? He says, this is a process you go through on a campaign to research your opponent, understand their statements, their voting record, their, you know, their business dealings, in order to better communicate with voters about the choice they have in the election and how decisions can be made and how they might impact the future. Defense says, you worked on a lot of campaigns. You ever worked on a campaign that didn't conduct opposition research? No, in fact, I haven't. He says, is it in your experience uncommon for a campaign to research their opponents? Not at all. In fact, it's probably malpractice not to do it. How many employees and people at the campaign were involved in doing this stuff? I don't recall precisely, but a lot. Did Perkins Coy play a role in any of this? Yes, they did. Can you describe what role? Well, opposition research on Donald Trump was really complicated. You know, he was incredibly litigious. So there was a lot of work to be done around different lawsuits that'd be filed or filed against him. So the other thing that was particularly complicated about him was all these international business dealings he had obtaining those records. Understanding that was a very opaque web of businesses internationally was incredibly complex. And so that piece of work was assigned to Perkins Coy on the international piece. And they, they assisted quite a bit. They had their team draft through and, and run through the domestic issues. The fence says, to your knowledge, did Perkin Coy engage any third parties or consultants to help? And Robbie says, I was not aware at the time of anyone engaged to do that work. I've obviously read subsequent things, but the defense says, well, let's okay. Let's focus only on that period of time. Anything? He says, well, He says, okay, when a campaign engages in opposition research, ask the defense, does the campaign care whether it's true or false? Do you care? Robbie says, you absolutely care. Sure. I mean, we spend a lot of money and hire a bunch of stuff to vet information for reputational purposes. So for us to go out and say a bunch of things that aren't true, you know, that can cause a lot of damage to the campaign. Uh, unless you do it on October 31st when the election's a few days away. And the defense says, when you gather opposition research, what's the ultimate point? Like, what are you going to do with it? Robbie says, obviously, I mean, the purpose of the campaign is to communicate to voters about what they're facing. And so we're trying to help them better understand what they can do. Defense asks one other question on Perkins, then we'll jump into Trump. Robbie, do you have any involvement to your recollection in getting or approving Perkin Coy bills for the work that they did on the campaign? Robbie says, I don't recall ever being engaged or in approving processing any invoices for any vendor at all. He's a campaign manager. That's not what he does. So the defense says, did you know how Perkins Coy charged for its work? I didn't. And over the summer, I think you said it, but just to make sure we cover it, who was Hillary Clinton's opponent? Donald Trump, the orange insurrectionist. That's not in the transcript. The defense says in the summer of 2016, was Trump's relationship with Russia something that the campaign was focused on? 
Yes. I mean, it frankly was something we were focused on before that time, but absolutely. Can you tell me more? Robbie says, yeah, I mean, look, starting in 2015, Trump made very favorable statements about Vladimir Putin, which was incredibly unusual for a Republican nominee. I recall him suggesting in the spring of 2000 and the jurors right now, all the Democrats that voted in phone bank for Hillary and donated it to the DNC that made it onto the jury panel. They're loving this. They're like, I remember this vote so aggressively. They can't even contain themselves. They say the United States, Trump was saying should leave NATO, whether it should exist. And he says it was really unusual for a Republican or for any nominee. Frankly, it was reckless. He had extensive business dealings in Russia, so we knew there was some kind of pre-existing relationship. And then we became particularly concerned when it became evident that the data was stolen from the DNC and later stolen from John Podesta. That it was probably stolen by Russian government actors. And then it was released at the times that would be inflicting maximum damage on Hillary. <laughs> the defense says... I mean, you kind of feel, you don't really feel bad for these people, but it's just kind of like, it's crazy. Like these people are crazy. What are they talking about? All right. You mentioned, you know, the emails that were stolen from the DNC. Do you remember when the first hack occurred? He said, I, I learned about it in May, 2016. Then the biggest releases I can recall was right before the convention in July. And you say that that was timed to drop. What do you mean by quote, timed to drop? Robbie says, well, we were just about to begin the convention and all of a sudden this, all this was stolen from the DNC. It's released out to the public. Remember that WikiLeaks and all the emails and all of it. When was Mr. Trump's relationship with Russia, something the campaign was talking about publicly? Robbie says, absolutely. I spoke about it publicly. And in connection with the general focus on Trump, was there a time when you learned about potential links between Trump and Alpha Bank? He says, yes, I did. I was briefed on that. And when was that? He said, you know, I honestly can't recall. Who else was there? Uh, it was Mark Elias. It was Jen Palmieri, Jake Sullivan, and John Podesta. Maybe others, but I definitely recall them being there. And was that prior to the summer of 2016? I don't think so. I think at the earliest it might have been in the summer, but I just don't recall exactly. Bosworth asks, and in a nutshell, what did the campaign do with that kind of information, this Trump-Russia stuff? Well, in that particular issue, but on all the others, he says, we weren't totally, we totally didn't understand it but we weren't totally confident in it. So we wanted to get it further vetted. But if it was true that there was some sort of passage of information between Trump and a bank in Russia, some oligarch, which is a main supporter of Putin, that's obviously incredibly alarming and concerning and probably something the American people should need to know about, about how they're going to vote. Defense says, and so the campaign wouldn't want to be associated with getting information out there that it hadn't vetted, would it? Right. We made a decision, you know, we didn't, we didn't run with it. As soon as it came on our radar, we wanted to get it out where it could be looked at further. And at some point you reached out to the New York times about this issue. He says, I don't recall a lot of details about that. Only nominally he says, I don't recall knowing who he was during the campaign. Anything about Michael Sussman. Were you aware of Sussman and other Perkins Coy lawyers working on this story? No. Were you aware that Sussman went to the FBI in 2016? No. Do you have any recollection? of anyone talking to you about going to the FBI on behalf of the campaign on the Trump Alpha Bank issue? No. Did you direct Sussman to go to the FBI on behalf of the campaign? Absolutely not. And did you authorize Sussman to go to the FBI? No. Did anyone else from the campaign, to your knowledge, direct or authorize Sussman to go to the FBI on behalf of the campaign? To my knowledge, no. Okay, well, as the campaign manager, would you have known about any effort to engage with the FBI on an issue like Trump and Alpha Bank? You run the place. He says, I would definitely have expected to know if something like that was happening. Absolutely. And what's the argument here? It's that Sussman wasn't acting on behalf of a client. He was acting outside of the scope of the representation. He didn't do anything according to the internal campaign procedures. And so they're saying this is consistent with his original story that he wasn't in fact there on behalf of a client even though he went back and billed her for it. So they're trying to create a disconnect there. They're trying to say, forget about the billing. The billing was all just one little, one little detail, minor detail. It's not even important. And it doesn't matter because they're going to try to basically dissect billing and to say, you can bill for all sorts of things. And maybe he was including a thought that he had about Hillary and he just sort of mislabeled it or whatever, who knows. But they're trying to disconnect the two and to say that, 
if Sussman had been acting on behalf of a camp campaign, he didn't do it appropriately at all. He didn't follow Robbie Mook or Hillary's guidance on any of this. This is the defense argument. So the attorney Bosworth says, in September 2016, would the campaign have wanted to engage with the FBI about this story? Well, look, I don't know. Speaking for myself, absolutely not. Why? Well, two reasons. The first is this was alarming information. So would the campaign have wanted to engage with the FBI? Absolutely not. He says it was alarming information. So if it was vetted to a place that we thought it was accurate, Yes, we would want that information out to the public. Going to the FBI does not seem like a very effective way to do that. You do that through the media, which is why the information was shared with the media. So he says, I would, I would not have taken that to the FBI. I would have just put it out there because he wants to win a campaign, doesn't care about America or something. Secondly, to be honest, he says, and I say this with respect because I'm sure a lot of people at the FBI are very patriotic and good people, but we did not trust them. <laughs> Why not? Why not? They're all your people over there. Okay. So I guess he's with the rest of America. But it says, I can say, you know, from a purely analytical standpoint as the campaign manager, two or three, probably the most damaging days of the campaign were caused by James Comey, not Donald Trump. And, you know, he broke protocol. He talked openly about investigations into Hillary and her emails. And presumably it was FBI agents that were leaking information about the investigation into her email. So they were mad at Comey for that. Yeah, I remember that. He came out and sort of opened the investigation and they say that that's why Donald Trump won the election. So they were mad. And that all happened while this was going on, wasn't it? So we did not trust the FBI at the time and so much so that Director Comey invited us to a briefing after the, uh, shortly before the election about election security and something like that. And we didn't go because we didn't, we just didn't want to have anything to do with it, you know, with an organization at that time or engage in that way. So nobody trusts the FBI. There was an allegation that the campaign had been treating the Trump Alpha Bank as an October surprise. Are you familiar with the concept of an October surprise? And I totally think that's exactly what this was. I mean, I, uh, how, how can you disagree with that? I mean, here is the, the tweet that went out that uh, Hillary Clinton and Jake Sullivan posted on October 31st, right? Days up before the election took place. And they... Uh, they waited until October 31st, which is, of course, an October surprise. That's the, that's the tweet that makes the final connection. So they say, what is an October surprise here there, uh, Robbie Mook? Well, it's a little bit mythological, but it's the idea that you have a devastating piece of opposition research on a candidate and you drop it at the last minute. So, you know, that the candidate doesn't have time to respond and as a result will lose the election. Sort of like what an, what a, uh, an actual email or a, a, a tweet like this might do. Let's see if we can open this up. Oh, dang it. Okay. Here it says, well, I think, I think they actually read that in the trans. You see the, the tweet. Defense asks... Mook, did you approach the campaign about this story in order for it to be an October surprise? Mook says, I don't recall thinking of it that way because it had many pieces of information that we had. Every day, you know, Donald Trump was saying things about Russian and Putin. So this was a constituent piece of information among many pieces of information. I don't think we saw this as a silver bullet and that was going to conclude the campaign, you know, determine the outcome. So like they didn't think it was going to be useful, even though they posted it October 31st with a big giant memo saying this could be the most direct link between Trump and Moscow because they had an indication that they may be losing this thing. There was a lot of Trump-Russia issues you were focused on, right? This was just one of many. Correct. Mr. Bosworth, thank you. That's it. That's the direct exam of Robbie Mook. That was the, that was the defense witness. Got through a whole witness on this. Now, they wanted to get him out quickly. And so we're going to see the cross-examination coming back over from the prosecutor. And my understanding is there's some good stuff in here. So we'll break this down. Mr. Mook, how are you? Mook, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's all good. How do you say his name? Do they keep screwing his name up? Mock, is it Mock or Mookie? Is it Mookie? I don't know how to say it. We say Mook here. I don't know what's so complicated about this. Mr. Mook, how are you? Mook, I'm sorry. It's all good. Mr. Mook, you testified that you were not aware at all during the campaign that Fusion had been retained. Is that correct? Correct. You were the campaign manager of the campaign and you didn't know that they hired Fusion GPS? Correct. 
And so as the campaign manager responsible for overseeing day-to-day -day operations, yeah. Would it be fair to say that all of the activity was delegated or that most of the activity was delegated to Perkins Coy? And he says, well, there was a particular piece of the research project that was delegated to them. Yeah. So the Trump-Russia stuff, would it all fall under that piece? Well, I don't know that that's a fair characterization, he says, because I mentioned earlier, we were dealing with Trump-Russia issues every day, right? And the hacks and all of that. That wasn't the question of Trump's relationship with Russia it was not wholesale delegated to Perkins. No. But the international aspects of that were delegated to Perkins, would you say? Uh, the pieces of opposition research that required overseas work and so on, yeah, that had been delegated to them. Okay, so Perkins was responsible for overseeing the research that Fusion was doing. Is that fair? So you weren't responsible, Perkins was. He says, I didn't know, and I still don't know the details of what relationship they had. So, so you weren't overseeing Fusion's work. I was not. I did not know that they had been retained. No, which is probably a good thing because he's not a lawyer, right? He can't really oversee that. Uh, it's my understanding he's not a lawyer. The, uh, so the prosecutor says, okay, so in fact, others, you said others on the campaign that knew that you knew of were not aware as well. Is that right? I'm not aware. I don't recall anybody else, any other campaign staff knowing anything about that. Prosecutor DeFilippis says, so any decisions, if people on the campaign didn't know, it was decisions being made by Perkins Coy. And again, I'm not clear on what the, which decisions you, he says to oversee fusion. All I can tell you, says Robbie, is that Perkins Coy, that I engaged Perkins to do the work and I have read in the press, they engaged Fusion. That's all I know. That's all right now. That's all that I can kind of tell you about. All right. So you were not overseeing Perkins work day to day. They were working on a number of things. I Okay. Were you, which of their things were you overseeing then? He says, well, they were our law firm and I was going to them on a regular basis for any number of questions and projects. Okay. And as to Fusion, you were not overseeing any of their work day to day. I didn't know that they were even retained, right? And so you can't oversee something that you didn't know exist, right? I mean, again, where, where this is a hard time for me is I don't know what the relationship is. I don't know what they were doing. I don't know anything about it. So, and Robbie's having a little bit of a hard time. I'm sure this is not coming off that well to uh, juries because he can, like, this is pretty obvious. You were not overseeing fusion. I don't, I didn't know that they were retained. So you would say no, right? Right. And you can't oversee something you know you don't know exists, right? And you would just say, correct, right? But he, he's being difficult. He's saying, look, again, it's hard for me. I don't know what the relationship is. I don't know what they were, they, were, they were doing. I just don't know anything about it. Okay, so then just say no. So you were or you were not overseeing GPS's work day to day. I have never engaged with Fusion and I didn't know they were retained. Okay, so say no. He says, okay, so you never spoke to Glenn Simpson? No, you never spoke to Peter Fritch? No, you never spoke to Laura Sego. And then the judge stops him because he didn't say yes, but he says, it's your understanding now. I'm sorry, Mr. Mook, you have to say yes. So maybe he's nodding his head, you know, nodding his head. And you never spoke to Laura Sego. He says, no, I did not. I did not know any of those people and did not engage with them. But it's your understanding now that all of those people were working on behalf of the campaign. So they were working basically for you. You didn't know that, but they were working for you, right? I didn't recognize some of the names you were saying. I don't know. I don't know who was doing that. He's being very combative. Okay, it is your understanding then that Fusion, is it your current understanding that Fusion was doing work on behalf of Clinton? Bosworth, objection, sustained. I don't see what the, the, the rationale was. Let's see here. It must be the form of, a, because he asked the question again, was Fusion GPS to your knowledge doing work on behalf of the Clinton campaign? And maybe it's a form question. I don't know. What I know is this, says Robbie, <clears throat> is what I've read in the press. Press reported that some work was being done for Perkins Coy, but that's all I know. And you were dealing regularly with Mark, right? Correct. And you did allow Mark to make decisions for the campaign. Says, yes, I definitely relied on his discretion. He was giving legal advice throughout the campaign. I wasn't like vetting all his decisions. You know, it was a billion dollar organization. So I depended on people's judgments for a number of things. Okay, so you depended on Mark's judgment at Perkins Coy, who were working with him. Is this fair? It wasn't just him at Perkins? I mean, definitely, yes, they were hired for their legal advice, and I was not double-checking their decisions, nor was it really, and prosecutor cuts them off. Says, okay, so if they needed to make phone calls or have meetings, you didn't, you know, they didn't check with you every time they did that. I was not vetting their schedules or giving approval for every engagement they had, says Robbie. Prosecutor says, now, 
Let's talk about the Alpha Bank allegations that Bosworth brought up. You said you don't know exactly when you learned of the Alpha Bank stuff, right? Yes, I can't remember the day or even the month, honestly. And it was Perkins Coy. It was Mr. Elias from Perkins Coy who first told you about that. Is that right, Robbie? I was briefed about those issues first by Mark Elias. And when you learned about it, you did not know where this information had come from, right? I don't recall, says the witness. Bosworth objects. They jump on the phone. Bosworth says, uh, Your Honor, apology. We're getting into material that I believe would be privileged. Alpha Bank issue. So saying that they're talking, they're talking, you know, about the conversation between Mark and Robbie now. And if Hillary and Robbie are clients of Perkins Coy, they may be crossing over into some of the um, attorney client privilege work product stuff. Yeah. So that's why they hop on the conference. What specifically he knew is going beyond what we think privilege holders would regard as fair game. Prosecutor says, your honor, I could probably phrase it in a way that would exclude legal advice. Judge says, okay, try that. Prosecutor gets back up, says, okay, look, Mr. Mute, Mr. Mook, uh, putting aside the legal advice that you might have received on the topic, to what extent were you aware of where the allegations or the data came from? Don't tell me about the legal advice that Mark gave you, but do tell me about what you knew about the data. I recall being told that the data had come from people that had or the information had come from people who had expertise in this sort of manner. Okay, so not about the advice about what to do with this or anything, just about the data itself. And you testified today, says the prosecutor, that you weren't totally confident in it. Those thumb drives and the papers and all that. Robbie says, that's right. And in spite of the fact that you weren't totally confident in it, did you meet with any of those experts? You didn't meet with any of them, right? Right. You didn't get any of their names. I don't recall getting their names, no. And you didn't You didn't gather any details about the technical aspects of the data yourself. No, I mean, it, that was a part of the issue is we didn't have any expertise on that. And once you learned about it, you started discussing it with the campaign and whether the campaign should affirmatively push it to the media, right? Correct. About affirmatively pushing this to the media. You started discussing this with people in your campaign, didn't you? Yes. And you had that discussion with Mr. Sullivan, Jake Sullivan, who is the national security advisor, didn't you? Correct. And you also had that conversation with Podesta. He says, just to be clear, this is what I recall those people. He says, correct. And you had that discussion with Sullivan? Yes. About whether to push it to the media, right? Yes. And with Miss Palmieri, with her too, right? Yes. And how about Podesta? Correct. Anyone else you recall having that discussion with? He says, those are the ones I recall definitely sort of. I'm fairly certain they were all a part of that discussion. And the idea would be that the campaign would put this information that you weren't totally confident in, in the media, right? Like you didn't know this was true, but you wanted to shove it out there anyways. Robbie says, well, that was the discussion was whether to share that with the media and how to share that with the media. Prosecutor says, ultimately, who was the highest member of the campaign? Well, he says, let me ask you this. Did the campaign decide we're going to push it to the media? Big question. Robbie Mook. Hillary Clinton's campaign manager says, we decided, my recollection is that we decided to give it to a reporter so the reporter could run it down more. And then obviously it's their decision and their discretion to publish it. Oh, very interesting. Okay, they say. But you, the campaign wasn't going to ask the reporter to hold off on a story, right? Like you didn't direct them to not publish it. Robbie Mook says, I don't recall ever asking a reporter to hold off on this, no. And in fact, it's the height of an election season. You're the Clinton campaign. You probably wouldn't want them to hold off on a story, right? If you could get a story out there, that's a good thing, isn't it, Robbie? He says, I mean, our hope was that they were going to run it down. It would be accurate or it would be, you know, it would be substantive and they would report it. Okay, but you guys, I mean, the campaign had received the information. You hadn't, quote, run it down, right? Well, we just didn't have the subject matter expertise. Okay, or the data. Now, so the campaign ultimately decided to give it to the media. We did, says Robbie. Yeah, we decided to give it to the media. I recall it was given to a reporter. And you made the decision, that decision with the people you just referenced, right? He says, correct. We discussed it, and then we made that decision. Oh, so that was all those people that he listed earlier. Let's make sure we have that. We've got Podesta. We've got Palmieri. We've got Jake Sullivan. And it looks like we've also got Mark Elias and everybody else who's a part of that team. So the prosecutor gets down and dirty and says, listen, Robbie, 
I got another question for you. Who was the highest member of the campaign who either was involved in or approved that decision? Robbie Mook says, well, John and I were involved. I discussed it with Hillary as well. <gasps> what? Hillary Clinton? He says, but I believed I discussed it with her after we kind of discussed it and made the decision. Prosecutor goes, what? John Durham sitting over there just salivating out of that walrus mustache. He's trying, he's trying to clean that up. He says, so you told Miss Clinton, we want to give this to the media, Robbie? Robbie says, I remember, I don't, I don't really remember the substance of the conversation, but notionally the discussion was, hey, we have this and we want to share it with a reporter. Prosecutor says, and how did Miss Clinton respond? Robbie Mook says, she agreed to that. Robbie Mook says Hillary Clinton agreed to that, to publishing an unvetted story with the media. And so at this moment, Robbie Mook is probably being relocated to protective services in case he accidentally falls up a flight of stairs and kills himself with three gunshot wounds to the back of the head. Good luck to Robbie now. Question from the prosecutor says, now, between the time you started discussing this and the time that Miss Clinton approved putting this in the media, what had you done to bolster your confidence in the strength of the allegation? Robbie says, I'm sorry, what had who done? You or anyone in the campaign? Robbie says, I don't understand your question. What have we done to bolster our confidence? He says, yeah, you said you learned of these allegations that you weren't totally confident in them. Remember that? Yeah, I remember that. So the prosecutor, okay. So from that time until when Miss Clinton approved the dissemination of this to the media, did it remain the case that you weren't totally confident in it? He says, yes. The point, and the prosecutor was like, ah, nope, 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 nope. zip it, buddy. Stop talking. He says, yes, the point. He's, I'm sorry. Nope, nope. Just yes or no. Sorry. Witness says, I'm sorry, your honor. Um, and the judge says, he can explain. Let him explain. <laughs> the, witness, the witness says, yes. Did it remain the case that you weren't totally confident in it even after the time Miss Clinton approved the dissemination of it to the media? Yes, you weren't totally confident in it. Prosecutor is just having a field day with this one. Dives back in, says, okay. So at the time Miss Clinton approved providing these materials to the media, did it remain the case that you, quote, weren't totally confident in it? Repeats the question. So part of the blank and the prosecutor jumps in. I'm sorry, you have to answer yes or no. But the court says, no, he doesn't. He can explain. So then Robbie's like, God, finally, thankfully, this judge is right in my pocket. Perfect. Says part of the point, Robbie, of giving it to a reporter was that they could run it down further. They could reach out the subject matter experts. They could have other people look at the data and the information. So giving it to the media, rather, your question implied that we waited to give it to the media until we had vetted it ourselves. And in fact, part of the purpose of giving it to the media was so that a reporter could vet the information and then decide to print it. Now, the prosecutor is unhappy with this and says, Your Honor, can we have a quick call? And the judge says, Yeah, get on the phone for a minute. And they get on the stinking phone and we can't see anything of what they're talking about. So they go on for two pages paid good money for these pages, $1.20 for this page, nothing here, ridiculous. Another $1.20 for this page, nothing here. What a ripoff. And then, it, you know, we like this is like another 20, 20 cents that we are not getting here. Unbelievable. <laughs> but it picks back up. They finish their bench, bench conference and the court says, all right, ladies and gentlemen, five minute break. So if you could just retire to the deliberation room, we're going to have to deal with this. And Robbie Mook is now asked to step down. Is your attorney here? Mook says, yeah. All right, well, why don't you have your counsel step out into the waiting room? Robbie says, okay. Defense says, your honor, you want me to pass it up? Yeah, you can pass it up. We have it back in the chambers. Everyone can be seated. I don't even know what they're talking about now. All right, please be seated. I'll tell you what, give me five minutes. So it's a recess. Judge gets off, off the bench, goes back into his chambers, comes back out. All rise, they stand back up. 
court says, all right, Mr. DeFilippis, if you can lay a foundation that he had knowledge that a story came out and that the campaign decided to issue the release in response to the story, I'll let you admit the tweet, okay? And this is what they're fighting about. That infamous tweet, this one, from Hillary Clinton. And it, this was the one that she published on October 31st. Computer scientists have uncovered a covert server linking the Trump organization to a Russian-based bank. Posted this, literally October 31st, 2016. And so this is this was written by Jake Sullivan. You see, it's a whole paragraph here saying that there's a secret line of communication between Donald Trump and this organization and all of it's fake. And so now that Robbie Mook is talking about it, the prosecutor wants to impeach him with this. If, if Robbie Mook is saying that, you know, we, we, we weren't doing some of this stuff, he can say, yeah, you were. We, you posted a tweet about it on October 31st. And the defense does not want that tweet to come in because it proves the prosecution's point. So the judge is now having to deal with this because previously the judge had said this was excluded. The judge said this could not actually come in. I had this marked down on our uh, closed, actually closed preliminary issues when we were covering the motions in limine. They said, you can't talk about this tweet. It's too far removed. You know, it's, it's too far out because it, it really is. It's kind of far out if you don't get into it but he's about to get into it. Let's see what happens. So he says, however, the last paragraph, I agree with the defense. It's more prejudicial than probative. No other evidence admitted in this case. The judge says he nor anyone at the campaign knew Sussman went to the FBI. No one authorized him to go to the FBI. No other evidence admitted that would justify this took place. And so he says this last paragraph, I think would unfairly suggest to the jury something problematic about this case. He says, all right, so your honor, two brief questions. Prosecutor says, can we, can we use, depending on what he says about whether he was aware of the tweet or the public statement, may we use it to refresh him? Yeah, you can do that. So basically you can use the tweet to ask him questions, but you can't get that tweet admitted in front of the jury. And they're saying that the, the bottom paragraph is, is too prejudicial in the case, which let's see what happens here. You can use anything you want to refresh, but we're not going to publish it. We're not going to read from it. Let's see what he says. Okay. I mean, given his testimony, I suspect that he will not be refreshed, but you can do that. Understood, Your Honor. And we'll make the redaction. Have a couple of minutes. Get the witnesses. Okay, it's redacted. Come back on up here, Mr. Mook. All right. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. We got everything worked out here. You can have a seat. All right. Sorry about the delay, Mr. Mook, says the prosecutor. Now, before the break, Robbie... You testified that there was a conversation in which you told Miss Clinton about the proposed plan to provide the Alpha Bank allegations to the media. Remember that? He says, yeah. What was her response? All I remember is that she agreed with the decision. Hillary's like, yeah, do it. And at some point, and again, as best as you can recall, what month would that have been? He says, honestly, I can't remember. Sometime in the fall, I can't remember when it was. Was it before the election? Yeah, correct. So probably like September, October. He says, again, my memory is not great on this, but uh, he says, what was the reaction from the candidate? He says, she thought we made the right decision. And by the time you briefed the candidate, Hillary, had it already been given to the press or was it essentially seeking final approval? Like, did Hillary have to rubber stamp this thing before it went out or not? And he says, well, look, I don't recall. I mean, honestly, the exact sequence of events, it's hard to remember. But the prosecutor asks, but you don't know who it was provided to in the media on behalf of the campaign, right? He says, I don't recall. I notionally recall that it was a member of our staff, but I can't remember exactly who. Prosecutor says, sitting here today, it could have been someone at the campaign or it could have been someone at Perkins Coy. He says, no, my recollection, it was a campaign staffer. I don't remember Perkins being a part of the effort to provide it to the media. And at some point there was a, I guess you don't know for sure, right? But one way or another, you don't know who gave it to the media. What I recall with our press department about them giving it to the media, but I don't recall any discussion about Perkins doing it. Okay, but you were not there when whoever gave it to the media gave it to the media, right? No, I don't recall sitting next to the person calling a reporter. No, says Robbie. And so from your knowledge, it could have been anyone affiliated with the campaign. He says, I recall it being a member of our press staff. So like someone who worked in our headquarters. Prosecutor says that's who was going to give it, but you didn't confirm whether they were the ones who gave it, right? They were going to, but you didn't confirm that they actually did give it. 
He says, oh no, I recall having follow-up conversations. I just can't remember the precise staffers. It was a lot of things going on. We authorized a staff member of the campaign to provide it to the media. And at some point there were news articles about it, right? He says, yes, I recall at least one story. Did one of them come from the New York Times or from Slate Magazine? He says, I recall a story from Slate. And in the time of that article or around the same time, the campaign issued a public statement, didn't they? He says, well, we may have, I mean, I just don't recall. Is there anything that would refresh your recollection in that regard? Did the campaign make a public statement about the Trump Russia Alpha Bank stuff? Oh, I don't recall. Is there anything that would refresh your recollection about that? He says, I don't understand. Is there anything I can show you that would remind you whether the campaign issued a public statement? And Robbie's like, well, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. What, where would we possibly issue a public statement? Robbie says, if there's a copy of it or something, I mean, I could. And Mr. DeFilippis says, I actually happen to have a copy of something right here. Your Honor, may I approach? He says, yes. And he says, okay, this looks right. Hands him the document. It's the tweet that Hillary and Jake Sullivan put out. And he says, okay, does that refresh your recollection there, little Robbie? And he says, yes, I don't, I don't recall, you know, engaging directly in developing this, but this looks, this looks correct. <laughs> so the prosecutor says, your honor, the government offers uh, exhibit 52, no objection from the defense court says so moved. And what does this appear to be there? Mr. Mook he says, oh, it's a tweet from Hillary Clinton's account. The one that we just showed you. And uh, the, the prosecutor says, yes, that's right. It is a tweet isn't it? Robbie, if you wouldn't mind, just for the record, see how there are two, just describe for the jury what we see here, the tweet. And then is there something else? He says, so there's the text in the tweet, and then there's the statement from Jake Sullivan. Prosecutor says, perfect. Well, let's start with the statement from Jake Sullivan. Remind the jury, who is Jake Sullivan? He was a senior advisor on the campaign. And is there any reason why he would be the one to issue a statement like this? And he says, well, you know, Jake's a pretty highly regarded national security expert, which is a big fat LOL as far as I'm concerned, because this guy has been, I think, what, what, what has he done for the United States national security? Did he do a great job in Afghanistan? How's he doing with Russia? He's not really competent at all, which is why he's in the Biden administration. So he's highly regarded according to Robbie. Okay, and so it makes sense that he's the voice on this. Could you just read the content of Mr. Sullivan's statement? And he says, uh, I can, starting with this could. He says, yes, go ahead and read that for us here, Robbie. Robbie starts, he says, this could be the most direct link yet. Prose nope, 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 I'm sorry, start at the top. Robbie's like, darn it, all right, I'll go to the top. He says, in response to a new report from Slate, showing that the Trump organization had a secret server registered to Trump Tower that has been covertly communicating with Russia, Hillary for America, senior policy advisor, Jake Sullivan released the following statement on Monday. He's like, am I done now? Can I please leave now? Should I keep going? Prosecutor says, oh yeah, we're just getting started, hit it. So Robbie continues, he says, this could be the most direct link yet between Donald Trump and Moscow. Computer scientists have apparently uncovered a covert server linking the Trump organization to a Russian bank. This secret hotline may be the key to unlocking the mystery of Trump's ties to Russia. It certainly seems that the Trump organization felt it had something to hide, given what it apparently took steps to conceal the link when it was discovered by journalists. All part of the tweet. Now, as I mentioned, they redacted that bottom paragraph. That bottom paragraph says the line of communication may help explain Trump's bizarre adoration of Vladimir, his endorsement of so-called Kremlins. It raises even more troubling question in the light of their mass minding, uh, mass masterminding hacking of the Clinton campaign. So they redacted all of that. And we can see that's here in the transcript. So the prosecutor says, all right, Mr. Mook. Court says, I think, all right, we're fine. Mr. Mook, can you please now go to the top part of the tweet there? The computer scientist part? Yes. And so it says computer scientists have apparently uncovered a covert server linking Trump and Russia. Prosecutor asked Robbie, who authored this tweet here? So I don't recall who authored it. I mean, we often had, well, we had a whole team that was offering tweets. So, okay. And so, but it was right. They had a whole team of people offering tweets and there was like just Donald Trump who would just like drop one. And it was like a, a, a burner, right? Okay. So, but it's in the name of the candidate. 
right? I mean, it came from Hillary's account. He says, correct. And you know, that's the sort of thing that on campaigns, frankly, you know, you'll tweet something from the candidate's account, but it's sort of, you know, what the voice actually is and all. It's always sort of a question. So like, who is it? Okay. And so you don't know one way or another whether the candidate drafted the tweet. No, I definitely don't. I would not probably have involved myself in crafting language on something like this. That was really for the press people, he says, uh, for, for them to do. Prosecutor responds, okay. Now, is it fair to say at this time that you still weren't totally confident in the allegation? Here's the hard part about your question, says Robbie. I'm not a cyber expert or a biologist. So, you know, again, part of the reason we gave it to the reporter and let the reporter go write it was because they were in the position to go talk to a bunch of experts. So I don't know how cyber links like this work and I can't, you know, I wasn't then and I'm not in the position today to know how any of it functions. Okay, says the prosecutor, but I mean, you testified earlier that you weren't confident in the allegation. So nothing changed between then and this tweet in terms of your confidence? Like you weren't confident, but then you published this. So did you publish it because you became confident? You said that you were going to vet this out to a bunch of reporters. Did they take it out there and vet it and give it back to you, which made you confident? So you published it? Yes or no? He says, well, the reporter had written about it. Oh, okay. So maybe it was. He says, and presumably, he says, Mr. Mook, I know a reporter published it, but I'm sure you know reporters often publish things that aren't true. Bosworth says, objection. And I saw this tweet earlier in the day. I think I posted this over on the mind map. When he made that comment about the media, you know, reporters publish things that aren't true. Apparently all the reporters got a little bit irritated about that. And so somebody posted a tweet. They were in the media room. And I think I put this on day here. Uh, yeah, the DeFilippis groan. Adam Goldman posted this on Twitter, says, DeFilippis asks if Mook, saying that reporters sometimes get stories wrong, grousing heard in the media room after DeFilippis made that comment. So all the journalists in there are like, oh, what a loser. We're Team Sussman and prosecutors say that we get things wrong sometimes and we know that we don't. Ah. So the court overruled that. And Robbie says, I mean, a reporter had written an article about it, put the moniker of their media organization behind it. It came from the New York Times. So obviously it has to be true. Mr. Mook, the reporter, the campaign had provided information to the reporters. Yeah, we had provided them with information. So, okay, the story that the reporter published, okay, it's possible that he could have gotten that information from the campaign, not from his own research. Robbie says, my understanding, and I didn't speak to the reporter. I didn't watch them do their work. My understanding was we gave them the information. And then the job of the reporter was to talk to folks, call the campaign for comment, call Trump Tower for comment and vet it out. And then write what they believe is true and what they're comfortable putting their name on. Which of course, as we know, is always the truth. A hundred percent, right? And the prosecutor says, do you know one way or another, whether it was Slate that leaked the information or that the campaign leaked the information to, did you give it to slate? Because you said, somebody said that in the tweet, Robbie says, well, first of all, it's not a leak because we weren't, you know, a leak would be something that someone was not authorized to share. So it was information that had been obtained. We shared it with someone at slate. That's all I know. So uh, yes, they did share it with slate according to Robbie. And the prosecutor says, okay. So it was the reporter who published the article who the campaign gave the information to. Oh, so you gave them the information, they published it, and then you said, uh, because they're a reporter and they signed their name to it, they must have done all those other things. Robbie says, I can't say. I mean, I presume it's true, but I didn't actually make the phone call, so I don't know. Prosecutor asks, is it fair to say this campaign would have been pleased that there was this out now? He says, yes, of course. We wanted, we thought this was a highly suspect, something troubling. We wanted the American people to know about it for sure. Mook, turning to another topic we discussed already, you testified that you had given discretion to Mr. Elias to carry out certain responsibilities. Is that right? Yeah, Mark had the discretion to give legal advice across the campaign. And that includes other lawyers at Perkins Coy. He says, yes, look, I know other lawyers at Perkins were working with the campaign. And you were responsible as the campaign manager for overseeing the budget items for the campaign. Robbie says, yes, I wasn't managing day to day, but ultimately, yeah, I had to manage the budget. And you and the campaign paid Perkins Coy over a million dollars throughout this election cycle, didn't you? So I don't recall the total sum, but I just don't recall. And it paid Fusion over half a million dollars through Perkins Coy. So Hillary takes your donations 
and then they send you, you know, those million emails for it and you make a $20 donation. Grandma's like, oh, I want to save America. Hillary gives that to Perkins Coy. Perkins Coy funnels that over to Fusion GPS, which gives it to Steele, who creates a fake dossier. They run it all back up the flagpole to Hillary, goes right back to Robbie Mook. He sends that off to the media, the New York Times, and says, because they published it, therefore it must be true. Wow. So he says, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, how much they made, but did you approve each and every one of the line items in the budget? He says, I gave Perkin Coy a budget to work with. I did not then subsequently approve the line items. They just followed within the budget. And when Perkins and they build times, did you trust they were reflecting actual work that they did? I mean, they're not billing you for work. They're not doing, they're not lying and stealing your money. Are they? He says, I trusted them. I had to trust Perkins implicitly to be honest and professional in everything they did. So he's not scouring through the bills. You know, he's not the guy at the restaurant. He's like, man, did you bill me this? Not that there's anything wrong with that. But he said, I just didn't have time to do that. You know, I'm busy. So you had no reason to doubt when Perkins Coy lawyer billed the campaign, they were doing work for the campaign. They sent the bill. You paid the bill because it was for the campaign. Pretty consistent. I was never involved in overseeing the billing, but I presumed that they were honest with us on all the things they did, including Michael Sussman. Yeah, right, says the prosecutor. And you assume the attorneys working for you weren't committing some kind of billing fraud, right? If they were billing work, it was for the campaign, right? It would be a problem if lawyers didn't do that. Got it. So one example, you mentioned the DNC hack about Mr. Podesta's emails. Isn't that right, Robbie? Yeah. And did you give Perkins Coy discretion to address those issues and formulate their own legal advice? You know, did you give them discretion to do things without checking you with you at every moment? He says, well, you know, the hack with the DNC is complicated because they are ultimately, it was ultimately the DNC's issue, not Hillary for America. So I was certainly involved in discussions of that, but my understanding would be that it would be ultimately left to the DNC. But how about the campaign? You allowed Perkins to conduct work at their discretion, didn't you? He says, I don't recall. I mean, I'm honestly not recalling any legal work about John Podesta's emails. And I don't recall delegating that to them or anything like them. Prosecutor asks, well, what about the cyber issues? Do you recall Perkins Coy addressing cyber issues? I recall there was a set of legal work taking place related to the DNC, but nothing else. I don't know if John was sort of personally somehow engaging Perkins or something else. I just don't recall. Prosecutor says, all right, well, let me show you this exhibit on page 283. Mr. Moop, you wouldn't have, I think you've testified, you would not have reviewed Perkin Coy bills or time entries, right? I did not. But looking at this document, which is already in evidence, if we go to the right, does looking so when they move it, there we go. He said, what we have here, Mr. Mook, is a time entry from one of Perkins Coy's lawyers, Mr. Sussman. The entry, could you just read the entry there? You mean the, quote, meeting with our MOOC? Yeah, the whole thing, the whole thing. Can you read it? He says, uh, so start with Klein. He says, yeah, start with meeting with Mr. MOOC. Okay, so Robbie starts reading. He says, meeting with our MOOC, our M. Elias, telephone conference with HFA, Hillary for America, draft crowd strike MFA modification for HFA, telephone conference with S. Henry, email with HFA regarding crowd strike and follow-up communications. So it's a billing log. And Robbie just read the whole thing. Prosecutor says, so one of the parties on the entry here appears to be meeting with you is Mr. Elias. He says, yeah, it seems like there was a telephone conference. I think that's what he's saying there. I don't recall. Prosecutor, I'm sorry, I'm just directing you. All right, if you look at the first part of the entry, it says meeting with our MOOC and Elias. So presumably there was a meeting between the three of you. Robbie says, yeah, uh, maybe. Yes, I mean, I don't remember a meeting. Okay, but if you look at the other entries, it looks like, do you agree that there are other entries listed on those lines? that appear to relate to different things other than your meeting with Mr. Elias. And so he's talking about this, right? The only thing here that was a meeting with Mr. Elias is kind of this part of it. The rest of it, telephone conference, drafting crowd strike modifications and all of that. Look, he says, I honestly, I don't know what he's, I don't know what this is, so I can't help you. So the prosecutor is getting a little, he's like, oh, let me help you with this. So for example, he says, it says draft crowd strike for MFA. Who is CrowdStrike? He says, well, it's a cybersecurity firm called CrowdStrike. Did they work for the campaign? I recall CrowdStrike working for the DNC. I'm not certain if they worked for Hillary for America. I do recall a discussion about different firms and whether they were acquired. But the prosecutor asks him, says, look, if Mr. Sussman billed an entry to the campaign about CrowdStrike, would you have any reason to doubt that, in fact, he was doing work for Hillary for America? Because he billed you for it. 
I don't even know what an MFA is, he says. So I don't, okay. I honestly don't know what this is. I think you'd have to ask someone else. I just don't know. So Robbie's like panicking, right? I don't, I, I don't, don't, don't. All right, he says, so if you look in the upper left-hand corner of this document, who billed for this work? Who is billed for this work? Who got the bill? He says, HFACC, Hillary for America. That's going to be the campaign. And Hillary paid its legal bills every month, didn't they? He says, look, I didn't. We were a huge organization. That's, I'm, I, this was a tiny part of it. I was not dealing with bills day to day. I don't know the answer to that. He says, I think we paid our bills, but I can't. You're asking me questions on things I didn't touch. Is that because you delegated them to others? He says, our operations team handled all invoices and billing and paying. So the prosecutor says, all right, well, hold on a minute. Let me show you one more billing record. And he says, actually not. We're going to come back to that. So he says, let's go back to the concept of October surprise. Robbie says, uh-huh. Can you describe that again for the jury? Says, again, I think it's a bit of a myth. It's something you do. Opposition research. It's so damning. You drop it out. They'll lose an election. And are you aware during the, you said you didn't even meet Sussman during the campaign period. He says, I do not recall meeting him during the campaign. And the extent that you were, or that he was working with Elias, you weren't aware of that. So the connection between Elias and Sussman, Robbie Mook says, I don't know anything about it. To the extent that Sussman may have drafted any of these materials, you weren't aware of that either. I don't recall being aware of Sussman, of any of the work he did with Mark, anything that might've been done regarding the media. I just, I don't know. I don't recall anything related to that. Prosecutor says, okay, it sounds like to the extent Sussman was doing something, he may have been doing something with CrowdStrike related to the campaign. We just saw the billing entry. It sounds like at least as of now, you don't know anything about that. Robbie says, I recall a whole bunch of calls and meetings and stuff that happened at the DNC. I was aware that CrowdStrike was involved. I just don't recall the specific conversations or Sussman being a part of that. The prosecutor says, okay, but that's fair. You let him handle his work and make decisions on that. Mr. Sussman, right? Yeah. Well, I didn't. I don't recall ever knowing him. So, okay. He says, so then it would seem you definitely did allow him to do it. In other words, he wasn't checking with you on those things. I don't recall talking or engaging with Sussman. That's what I know. You'd have to ask other people about that stuff. I just don't know. So what he's trying to get to get at is the way that Robbie Mook conducted the campaign is you sort of had permission first, right? You got to go do things. So he said, yes, you have the freedom and the ability to go do that. So he sort of gave people agency, right? He was an enabler. He said, yes, you have the freedom to go do that. You kind of did direct him to do that. Now, Robbie's trying to have it the other way to say, I didn't do, I didn't, I don't, I don't know anything about any of this, right? I had no involvement with any of this, but he's saying, but it's still within your hula hoop. Like that's within your jurisdiction. Just because you don't know about it doesn't mean that you couldn't know about it. You gave people permission to do it. You didn't stop them from doing it. You didn't say, don't do these things. And then they did it anyways, right? So you gave them the authority to do it at the outset, just by your management style. And that's what he's trying to get into. Now, Robbie doesn't like this because he's realizing that he's kind of responsible for this. And I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So the prosecutor says, okay, but look, it looks like assuming his billing is accurate, looks like he was doing something related to CrowdStrike. I can't speak to what the bill is. I just don't know. Okay. Now, let me show you another exhibit. You see another meeting here, meeting with McLean. What is this? First of all, who is the billing attorney on this entry? It says under timekeeper, what do you see? He says, okay, I see under timekeeper name, it says M. Sussman. What do you see for a billing entry on September 5th? Meeting in McLean, Virginia to work on a white paper, follow up on a telephone conference with an email. Mm, another billing entry. So they ask Robbie, so they say in September, 2016, it's fair to say from your prior testimony that you weren't aware of these bills. Yes, I don't know what these are. I was not aware of him doing any work. Were you aware of a concept of a white paper or any papers about this allegation? I don't recall anything like that either. Did you have an understanding that there were materials that were being given to the press on Alpha Bank? He says, as I've said, what I recall is our staff provided information to the media. I don't recall specifically what it was. So he doesn't remember much of anything either. Just like Mark Elias. Isn't that interesting? And were you aware that anyone at Perkins was lobbying the media to push a story like this? I was not aware of that. But it would have been consistent with what you wanted to do. The campaign decided to provide this to the media. And if Perkins did that, did it, that would be consistent, wouldn't it? Well, what I know, you know, what I recall is I don't recall Perkins playing a role in any of this with the media. I don't know what they did. And I don't know. You'd have to ask them. I'm sorry. The decision to made was made to share it with the media. 
What I recall is that our leadership team on the campaign decided to direct members of our press team to share the information with the media correct. And going back to the October surprise, you mentioned it's a concept where you put information out to the media that isn't strong or vetted. Is that part of it? He says, not necessarily, no. So he says, okay, describe it again. What is an October surprise then? He says, you drop something because the opponent didn't have time to respond to it. And it's supposed to be damning information. Is that your testimony? Yes. It's supposed to be something that is so scandalous, so damning that a lot of voters change their mind when it comes out. Was the Alpha Bank allegation, Robbie, something that might fall into that category? He says, well, it certainly was alarming and suspicious. The issue is we didn't know what that data, what it was going back and forth. Mr. DeFilippis says, okay, well, how about this? Uh, let's pull that tweet up again. Can you tell me the date of that tweet there, old Robbie? He says, well, it says here, October 31st, 2016. And Mr. DeFilippis has another mic drop moment. Thank you, sir. And he exits. Because that feels like an October surprise, doesn't it? And it feels like we just got a lot of testimony that Hillary knew about it, that the whole campaign talked about it, that they knew this information was bad and not vetted, and they sent it to a reporter anyways, and they directed their press people to do it. And it sounds exactly like an October surprise. Pretty good stuff there. Very effective cross-examination from Mr. DeFilippis there. Hillary Clinton authorized the Trump-Russia collusion hoax, according to her own campaign manager. Big juicy meatball out on this lovely Friday. Love that. All right. And so we now we get a redirect examination from Mr. Bosworth. Now he comes back out and ordinarily, you know, we kind of fly through this, but let's spend some time on it this Friday afternoon, shall we? All right, Mr. Mook, first a follow up questions. Can you give an example of an October surprise? Something that's happened in real life, he says? Uh, well, I can't think of a time where it's happened in my career. I mean, it'd be some late breaking scandal. I can't think of it off the top of my head. And so even if you, you're familiar with it, what's the type of thing you have in mind when you talk about an October surprise? Uh, he says something scandalous. Could in the fall of 2016, there were a lot of connections about Trump to Russia. There were stories about it, says Robbie. Would a story about additional connections have been so damning and game changing that it would be an October surprise. So the defense is saying, this is not even an unusual story. There's, everybody's talking about Trump and Russia. So who cares? Doesn't change anything. It's just one more story. He says, I never thought of it on this way. I mean, there was a lot of information about Trump. Trump himself at a rally told Russia to leak Hillary's emails. The Republican party changed their plat platform to say they should not give aid to Ukraine. They flipped that back pretty quickly. We just gave them $40 billion. The Republicans were falling all over themselves to send money, more money overseas and engaged in another endless war. So I thought that there were plenty of damning stories about Trump and Russia. I did not see it as some sort of silver bullet. And so they're saying that he didn't characterize this as an October surprise. Bosworth says you were asked about the tweet that was issued on October 31st and the article that came out in Slate. What is Slate? He says it's a news organization. And where does it sit in the hierarchy of news media? He says, you know, with all due respect to Slate, you know, it's not the New York Times. I mean, it's not a paper of record. And the New York Times isn't really the New York Times either. Mr. Bosworth says, if we turn to, forgive me, let's go to the fifth to the last page, blow that article up. Talks about the article. Starts with, in September, the Philippus wants an objection. Says, can we hop on the phone here? Doesn't like where this is going. Because it sounds like they actually pulled the article up from Slate. They're showing the article from Slate on the screen. The Philippus asked the judge, Your Honor, I'm not sure where Bosworth is going with this. Seems like he could be getting into the zone of using the Slate article to try to argue there was legitimacy to the data, which if it were Mr. Sussman reviewing the article could be permissible. But as to Mr. Mook's state of mind, I don't think this is within your honor's order. Bosworth says, I'm going to use this article for two purposes, Your Honor, which is in evidence. And he says, it's in evidence, right? Number one, the fact that this makes reference to the New York Times article being pursued in September, which is what I want to distinguish Sussman's work from that article. And then ask Mook whether there were questions or conversations about the press. And the court says, okay, I'll allow it for that one. You can ask about that. And number two is in response to questioning about the Philippus. Well, did you just release this article without any vetting about Mr. Mook's testimony? that he assumed the reporter did vetting. I want to point out there were numerous researchers and independent experts that FOWER consulted 
in the article. So saying that the, art, the, the journalist actually did vet it, right? That, that, that wasn't unvetted, even though Robbie Mook could not answer that at all. You know, did you, did you vet it any further? He said, I don't know. I just presumed the journalist did. And we published what the journalist talked about. Court says very well. And they pull those pages up. So he's allowed to ask about both those things. Bosworth comes back out. All right, Mook. So if you could read the portion beginning in September, read those couple of sentences. And he's reading from the actual article, right? In September, the scientists try to get public to pay attention to their data. There's a Reddit thread. New York Times' Eric Lichtblau posted a story. And he's reading the whole thing. So my question is, the conversation that you talked about with the staff, et cetera, in the campaign about going to the press, sitting here today, there was a Slate article published, something else you're not aware. He says, I don't recall. Okay, take that down. Uh, Mr. Mook, you were also asked on cross-exam about the vetting of information and how that relates to the media. How is this helpful? He says, well, it's helpful because the reporters, they go out in a way, they run something down that is hard for our campaign to do. We can't do that, so they can do that. There's a paragraph that they reference on page seven. It says the first three sentences, Robbie Mook reads this, something about in a world of DNX ex ex experts, Paul Bixie is a very high authority and saying that there were communications happening in secret fashion. They're passing documents around. And Bosworth says, I'm gonna ask you whether you see this article published back October 31st. It's about the FBI investigation into Alpha Bank. Could you flip through that and reference this? He says, sorry, it's a long document. I don't see the FBI mentioned in here, he says. No reference to an investigation? Robbie says, I don't see one. If the campaign knew of information and wanted to get it out in the press, does it know how it would do it? So well, we had pe people who are very capable on our team here. And it, you also worked with Perkins Coy about advice on the campaign. He says, yes, there's a distinction. They were our legal counsel and I deferred to them on legal advice, but we had research people for research projects. And anytime you're operating overseas and dealing with businesses, it's very complex. And so we defer to them on that. Sharing something with the media is a political decision. So we've got legal decisions and political decisions. I said, I definitely would have been expected to have been in a decision like that. And I did not delegate that to Perkins. What about a decision to go to law enforcement? Who makes that decision? Robbie says, it depends. Could be two different things. Bosworth asks, you said earlier that Clinton, Hillary Clinton, secretary at the time, had to approve the decision to go to the press with the article. Did Hillary Clinton approve any decision for Michael to go to the FBI on behalf of the campaign? Robbie says, I'm not aware of anything like that. To your knowledge, nobody did, right? I don't know of anybody doing that, and I don't know why she would. Okay, Mr. Mook, thank you. And the court says, all right, Mr. Mook, thank you for your testimony. You are excused. And it looks like that is the end of his testimony. So we've got Mr. DePhilippus has a couple questions. Your Honor, I think we'd ask for, for, for permission to ask one question. Bosworth exceeded the scope. We purposely excluded from our question the FBI piece about the tweet and elsewhere. I propose to ask one question about whether he's aware of the New York Times article. And Bosworth says, Your Honor, Eric's going to be testifying. They can ask him about that. I asked about an article that's in evidence in response to a tweet they offered. And the court says, we're going to cut him off at that. Okay. All right. You're excused. Thank you, everybody, for your testimony. Don't discuss this case. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take our lunch break. It's 1240. So we're going to come back in later. Have a great lunch. No discussion about the case. Parties are here. Talking about hearsay. Court's going to strike two sentences, and those got redacted in the document. So, all right, we, how long do you have for your next two witnesses? Al Gore says, Mark Chattison, going to be 15 minutes, Kevin P., 30 minutes, and we're going to finish up with plenty of time, Your Honor. I believe so. Have a good lunch. And that's the transcript, my friends, for day five of the Michael Sussman trial. And boy, that was another very heavy-hitting day. We had two key witnesses, Robbie Mook, and FBI General Counsel James Baker with some pretty hot testimony today. My goodness. Hillary Clinton formally approved of the Trump-Russia collusion story being published as an October surprise. Now, she's not going to characterize it that way, but of course, we will. And so that is it, my friends. I want to make sure we hit some of the Super Chat donos and say thank you for everybody to help fund the purchase of those transcripts. Those are a buck twenty a page. 
And I really do appreciate the support, however it comes in, whether it's a super chat, a super thanks, signing up and watching the watchers.locals.com, becoming a member on YouTube, all very helpful. And you could also, if you if you just are somebody who is just keeping your ears open, we have an amazing law firm. I'm a criminal defense lawyer at the RNR Law Group. We're in Scottsdale, Arizona. We have an awesome team of people. I trust them so much that they can just do the work and they, they, they crush it. We have meetings every day where we talk about our goals. We're revamping a lot of our internal systems. I'm very excited about the work we're doing. And so if you happen to know anybody who's been charged with a crime, would love it if you referred them to our law firm, rrlawaz.com and the phone number is in my link tree down in the description below. You can schedule an appointment online as well. And I appreciate your support. You know, the more, the more sort of, um, more, more sim symbiotic relationships we can have with me being here with you and the sort of the, the evolution of the law firm, the better. And so I'm still trying to combine the two worlds and I appreciate your help doing that. All right. So we had some super chats come in big shout out to Harold Miller. Thank you for the, the super chat dono for the transcripts. Andrew Passaman is here, says, awesome explanation of the trial. Thank you. Do you worry about being unemployed due to prosecutors letting lefty criminals go free? Uh, no, I don't worry about that. You know, I, I, I'm not real sure what the prosecutors are doing in other parts of the world, but there is some insanity in Arizona. Things are pretty steady. And I think most normal societies are pretty steady. We don't have any really insane liberal prosecutors who are letting everybody out, but it, but I am in favor of more, more justice in our criminal justice system, right? So just because they're maybe changing how justice is completed doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. Like for example, here, one of my points here that I talk a lot about is that our justice system has become punitive instead of rehabilitative. And that's not a good situation. If you, you, you really can't punish the pain out of people. So if you have an addict, right, who's got multiple drug offenses, you're just going to punish him more and he's going to get sober. Like that doesn't really work. Now there are violent offenders and there are more and more stories of people letting everybody out, including, you know, aggravated assaults and all sorts of, you know, more serious crimes, which are a little bit crazy, but that's not happening here in Arizona. But thank you for that, Andrew. Chris Wolney says Hillary got her October surprise early. So she had to create something bigger on Trump. She has so many skeletons that some will occasionally come out. They're starting to her own campaign manager is now saying, yeah, you, uh, you, you authorize this. So Robbie Mook's going to be on high alert, I think for the future. James Carver says Epstein didn't kill himself and neither did Robbie Mook. Neither did Robbie Mook. So thoughts and prayers for Robbie Mook have a very safe weekend, hopefully in an undisclosed location. Everybody knows what happens when you cross Hillary. It doesn't go well. James with a super chat dono. Thank you, James, for that one. We had Chris DeBayer says this one from Oz across the ocean for day four. Wow, FBI must get you a beach. So that's from Oz. Shout out to Chris. Thank you for being here across the ocean back on day four. And thank you for the dono on that one. Bart with a nice super chat for the transcripts. Thank you, Bart. Jeb Fuller. I'm in DC. No way it's a fair trial from Jeb Fuller. So is a hung jury a victory using this trial to shed light on the other info? I mean, a hung jury is better than a, an acquittal right? or not guilty right? Because then they, they have the possibility of retrying it. But if they get a hung jury out of a DC jury on this, I'm not sure that they are going to retry it. And I think I'd probably still consider that to be a loss. We'll see. I mean, the jury, we'll see how the jury goes, but there were some pretty hardcore people on there. We had the other one uh, here. This was from I T O the C to the E I to the C to the E. I think it's ice says, Rob, did you ever play the Ace Attorney video games? They aren't accurate depictions of court, but every time you say objection, I think of them. No, I haven't played it. I've never even heard of it. Do they get very animated in their objections and sort of scream them from the rooftops? That's the best way to do your objections is to get angry. Now in the court of law, you don't really do that, but we're not in the court of law. We're in the court of YouTube. And so we can have a little bit more fun here. Uh, Elaine Smith sent one in, says love from Texas, the great state of Texas. And I know we've got a lot of Texas viewers there and love Texas. Thank you, Elaine Smith, for that. A really big one came in from Deb DB924. Very nice transcript, Dono. That's very helpful. Thank you for that, DB924. Not even a question on there. Just a big, fat, whopper Dono. And I want to make sure that I got everybody else here. So let's see what we had from earlier today. Those were all yesterday. So we got Tim Carraway, Mary Briggs, Ordock. We got that one. 
Zulu's here with a couple. The Election Defense Fund, Vampires, Anthony Henson with a super chat, Malamute Aerospace with many, James Gutierrez, Charlie Delta, thank you for your effort in covering this case. Thank you, Charlie. Mark Mills, Scott Benedict, Malamute Mills, Christina Malaman says, thanks for the great work. I went for a run and I had my memory jog. Linda Diaz, Lori Kova, great job. Love that I can see the actual transcript and not what someone tells me happened in the court. Yeah, that's from Lori Kova, which is a great point. You know, and I get so frustrated about this when I read news articles in the media and things. They literally are just like summer. I would read the news article if they gave me the sourcing, but they don't give you any sourcing. And so it's just very hard to read. I'd rather just read them here with you. Jordan LePage donating to the transcript fund. Teresa Salazar also with another super chat. Kay Bean was here, says big transcript is a racket making you pay those prices for public info. Totally agree with this, Kay Bean. And I was thinking about this the other day. I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, if the federal courts won't allow you to watch it or to listen to it, the least that they could do would be to just make the transcripts available, right? Pay for the transcripts and post those publicly, but they won't do that. So every single day, I have a morning payment and a night payment for the morning transcripts and the night transcripts. And actually there's one clerk. So there's three court reporters who I've been working with on this trial and they, they sort of, you know, rotate in uh, Lisa. There's, yeah. Lisa has been doing the mornings. Lorraine has been doing most of the afternoons. And I think, yeah, there's another Lisa in the afternoon. She's just been billing me. She's just like, I'm just going to bill you at the end of the trial. I'm tired of sending you invoices. I'm just going to bill you at the end. You want them every day. So that's fine. Send me the bill, but you can see, you know, it's, it, I agree with you, KB. And I think it's, it's ridiculous. Like let us listen in at least on the phone or give us the transcripts for free. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Ronnie Cole says, would you just make up transcripts like they made up the Russia gate? Yeah. I mean, I could type up day six if you want, see how fun that would be, you know, go through it, just make the whole thing up. Jeb Fuller says I'm in DC. No way. It's a fair trial. Bart with a, with a dono. Chris DeBayer, and I think I've got those. Elaine Smith was a love from Texas. Thank you for that. Andrew, Harold Miller, DB924 with a really big one. Thank you. And let's see what's going on over on Locals because we had the Locals comment thread that we queued up before the show started. Let's do a quick refresh on this. We have uh, this one from Soul Viking. It says, well, let me hear. Let me put these up here so I can actually do this on the screen. Vet some of these things out. Oh yeah. So yeah, this is good. So soul Vikings here. Soul Viking says Robbie Mook was a gift to Donald Trump with his poor strategy decisions, including Hillary Rodham. There was no need to campaign in Wisconsin. Hillary's diversity hire apparently failed her, not her best decision. America was fortunate to have this incompetence. Thank you, Robbie. LOL. That was from soul Viking. My name is also, I grew up as a Robbie, so I could say it with a little bit of oomph. Vienticus says, here's a screenshot of the Ace Attorney game, which is fun. I've not, I've not played that game or heard of it, but that looks like it's fun. And that looks like a strong objection right there. He even has a little Pell pin on there and everything. Vienticus says, Rob, just make the most of the blacked out transcript and just make something up. <laughs> I should have done that. Oh, I should have done that. It's a good idea, Vienticus. We have here Another one from Soul Viking says, I can't tell you because I'm not a neuroscientist statement with respect to his memory. The latest after Kintanji's inability to define a woman as a, not a biologist. That was until, of course, I came across a time to discuss a woman's right to choose. You have to love it or not. That's from Soul Viking. I know. And it was right. No, nobody's a biologist or a neuroscientist. It's all very complicated. Kincaid said, isn't it possible for someone in the DNC to change the status of who was informed after the fact? Is there any confusion as to why he came to the FBI? Will they be able to downplay or justify his actions? Seems like the case is building up to that coveted yellow card. Well, I think the defense is trying to bolster his justification for this, right? They're saying that he went over there as a good citizen. And where else are you supposed to go? Even James Baker, they're using the James Baker tweet to say, even James Baker tweeted about this. Come to us if you have info that you need to share. So they're saying that he was just doing what any good citizen would do. Vienticus says the super chat about the locals address was because I accidentally put in the wrong URL. Did I miss one from UV? I hope I didn't miss any super chats. I apologize. Sometimes I get carried away. 
Monster One says, glad you're back doing lives again. I'm starting to withdraw like Hunter Biden outside a Parmesan cheese factory. That's from Monster One. <laughs> uh, well, you know, yeah, Hunter Biden. I'm not sure if he's looking at Parmesan. Soul says, as an obvious on the mind map and by history, the esteemed Clinton political machine has many long tentacles. In the spirit of musical chairs, it's going to be interesting to see who's left standing when the music stops. Pathetic they all are. Kenny Cole says, if I leave money in the tip jar here on Locals, can you use that? Uh, yes, you, yes. So that that converts over to currency, to US dollars. Ken Ennett is saying, do tips benefit creators monetarily? Yes, they do. So if you are on Locals and you don't want to super chat and you want to leave a, a tip over on Locals or just jo join on Locals, uh, you can certainly do that. And it all just goes to USD. It does not stay as a Locals coin. So I can use that for the transcript. So thank you for that. Ken in it and some final shout outs over to locals in the locals chat. Let me do a refresh here. My screen. It's not refreshing. So I think that is it. Let's see if there's anything else that came in. Mike L sent this one in it says if Sussman is found not guilty, could Durham get a venue change for the next trial since the jury pool is biased? Nope, that's done. If Sussman gets a not guilty, that's it. It's over, right? There's no redos. There's no try it again. It's it. That's the end of the game. So that's why it's kind of important. That's why we're spending a lot of time on this is all the eggs in this basket. And if they can't secure a conviction, then it may be the end of the Durham special counsel, the end of Durham prosecution. And uh, hopefully that doesn't happen because there's a lot of nefariousness going on out there. And, you know, this is how I think you start to make some serious progress in this country by memorializing this, documenting this, not letting these people escape from this at all. I mean, when I started this channel years ago, one of the things that I would do is I would hold up police officers' mugshots who got in trouble with the law. I would say, look at this. These people are supposed to be enforcing the law, protecting America, you know, and upholding our safety and our security. And they're out here committing crimes. In many ways, in my opinion, the mind map is kind of like that. It's an elevated version of this. This is a memorialized document. This is a, a, a beautiful, in my opinion, I mean, it, it, it details everything. It shows all of the different actors here and they are going to be ensconced in this digital framework forever. And as this investigation continues to unfold, we're going to continue to beef this out. And if there was a conviction, if there is hopefully a conviction against Sussman for this, the Durham tentacles will continue to expand in other directions and other people will be brought to justice because we have a country to run here. And if this type of stuff is allowed to just fester under the surface, that is a gigantic problem for all of us, Democrats, Republicans, and the like. And so we're going to continue to cover it. I appreciate your help doing that. It would not be possible to do this without you, literally. Uh, if, if there was no, you know, I, I would not be able to afford this sort of on a whim, like a hobby, you know, you know, extra 4,000 bucks just to like have some fun and talk about, wouldn't be able to do this without you. And so I think it's really important. I'm very, very grateful for all of your support, however you want to do it. And if you are not already subscribed, if you're not already, you know, somebody who has liked this video, I would love it if you did that, invited somebody else to come see this. Even Elon Musk is talking about it now. So hopefully we get some more eyeballs and attention on this. And I appreciate all the help that you provide in helping us get our message out. But enough for me, my friends, that is it for the day. We squeezed another eight hours of court testimony into about three hours and seven minutes here. Had a lot of fun doing it. I hope you enjoyed the content. One more reminder to give us a like before you get out of here. Share this video with friends or family. And remember that it's the weekend. We've got to unplug from politics a little bit because next week we're going to come back and do it all again. And we're going to continue to shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. And that's it for me, my friends. Have a tremendous weekend. Sleep very well. I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Bye-bye.